Recording started. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Broadband for All Roundtable. A few housekeeping items before we begin. For attendees, please use the Q&A function if you have a question. Questions will be answered at the end of the roundtable so we can combine similar questions and maximize our time. The host will use chat to provide links and information referenced during presentations. A video of this roundtable and the slides will be made available on the Broadband for All portal. The link will be provided in the chat. A reminder to presenters, please cue Jeff Lee Nolish to advance your slides when presenting. We do have a full agenda today and respectfully request that speakers keep to allotted timeframes and attendees use the Q&A functions for their questions. With the housekeeping items addressed, I'd like to introduce Government Operations Agency Secretary Amy Tong, who has been playing a key role in advancing the state towards broadband for all. Secretary Tong. Thank you, Jules, and uh, welcome everyone and good afternoon um, to this uh, broadband for all roundtable. We are pleased to see so many education, uh, library and community-based partners united around our common goals to close the digital divide and foster digital equity and inclusion in California. Broadband is essential in modern life. Today, with school, work, and healthcare increasingly and often entirely available online, California's ability to access and use broadband is the difference between being able to fully engage in or being cut off. And yet, too many Californians still do not have access they need it is time to close the digital divide. We face, we face complex and deep rooted challenges in delivering broadband for all. We also recognize achieving broadband for all will require partnership with and support from the broadband industry, federal, local, and tribal governments. Schools, libraries, and community-based organizations are critical partner in this effort. Thankfully, we are at the moment in time where federal and state policies priorities and findings are aligned around the goal we share. The state's Broadband for All program is based on the foundation that broadband access, adoption, and training are essential components of digital equity, and that the digital equity is the goal for every Californian. Today, you will hear about the progress that the California Broadband Council members have made on the implementation of the Broadband for All Action Plan, we will provide updates on the state's historic $6 billion investment on broadband middle mile infrastructure and last mile grant programs that the governor and the legislature created and funded last July when passage, with the passage of SB 156. Furthering these efforts and the reason federal bipartisan infrastructure legislation allow, uh, uh, allocated an additional $62 billion to further support states through a variety of broadband and digital equity programs. California is actively pursuing these funds to support our digital equity efforts and augment the effort that you are undertaking at the regional and local level. We are eager to expand existing partnership, create new partnerships, and align efforts with yours to achieve broadband for all in California. Thank you. Back to your deal. I believe Secretary Thurman is next. Thank you, uh, Secretary Tong, for those wonderful remarks. Greetings to everyone uh, who's part of the Broadband Council and to everyone who's participating in today's program. It's great to see our state librarian, Greg Lucas, and Sonny McPeak, and so many others who we've had a chance to work with uh, in making sure that we close the digital divide in California once and for all. I don't have to tell any of you how hard these last two years have been for all of us, uh, seeing disruptions of every kind, uh, experiencing uh, the loss of loved ones uh, to COVID, watching acts of hate uh, in many of our communities, starting with the killing of George Floyd, the spike in hate against the Asian American and Pacific Islander community, seeing bullying and mistreatment of many of our LGBTQ plus students. Um, our communities have experienced multiple pandemics, um, the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as the pandemic of racism. Not to mention that 20 counties in our state experienced wildfire during the pandemic and other forms of natural disaster. We know that there are many challenges um, that our communities have faced 
but California continues to rise to meet the challenge where our families and students are. And so for those of you who I'm seeing for the first time, uh, it is uh, a moment to say thank you uh, for the work that you did to help us. Within days of the start of the pandemic, we uncovered um, that many of our students were without the basic tools that they needed to be connected uh, to their educators and to their school communities. Sadly, we found that as many as a million students, as we were moving into distance learning in every school in our state, as many as a million students were without computers and maybe another million students were without access to high speed internet. And so clearly this made it difficult for our students to stay connected. And we know that there've been some impacts uh, for our students. Uh, many of you rallied to the cause. I'm grateful for all of you and the governor, our, our legislators, our first partner, um, the State Board of Education President, Linda Darling-Hammond, who joined with me as we worked to get donations um, for many of our students. Uh, I'm grateful to those of you who joined the efforts of our task force on closing the digital divide that was able to secure low cost internet for many families in our state. And I'm grateful to our partners, our internet service providers who agreed to provide internet to our students and families for as little as $10 a month. Thank you uh, to you for your partnership. I'm also grateful to our partners in the, uh, the legislature and the governor who provided billions within days of the pandemic that ultimately allowed us to secure uh, 1 million computers for California students. And I'm certainly proud to have served as, a, as an author, uh, I'm sorry, as a sponsor of legislation that ultimately led to the $6 billion that we now have to build out um, the infrastructure so that we can have broadband for all in every part of our state and that never again will our students have to go without uh, the basic tools to be connected. Let's build beyond that. We know that technology is an important part of every aspect of learning. And so let us work to a, a day when every student in our state will have access to computer science training and other types of training that prepare them for the jobs of the future. We know that these are incredible opportunities that can go unfilled unless our students have the training in STEAM and other topics that can help them prepare to take on these incredible roles as we move forward. So I'm grateful to everyone uh, at the Broadband uh, Council. Uh, thank you for uh, the work of the Affordability Connectivity Plan that provides additional supports to Californians. I know there's a lot of work to do to get past the middle mile and the last mile, but we are California and this is something that we can do. And I hope that you all will continue to think in a spirit of innovation in the same way that we've named an innovation challenge where we're offering a million dollar cash prize to an entrepreneur, an innovator, a researcher who helps us think through a way um, to make great strides in innovation in creating connectivity and closing the digital divide. Uh, on behalf of our 6 million students, I'm grateful for what we are doing and how we will allow technology um, to align with all the things that we're doing to help our students moving forward. We're gonna provide them with 10,000 counselors to recover and heal from the trauma of the pandemic. We're gonna make sure our students learn to read by third grade and have access to great programs that allow them to learn another language. And the work being done by the Broadband Council is in direct alignment with all of these efforts uh, to prepare our students for the jobs of tomorrow. So that's it for now. Please accept my thanks, and we look forward to the recommendations that come out of this uh, roundtable and uh, further efforts in creating greater connectivity for California students, educators, and families. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Superintendent Thurmond. Um, State Librarian Lucas. Well, hi, I'm Greg Lucas, the California State Librarian. Uh, thank you, Amy, and thank you, Superintendent Thurmond. Uh, not not really sure what else I can add other than uh, to say how grateful I am to be included in uh, roundtables like this. Uh, it's given, given all of the investment that the state's making, both in connecting hard to connect places at parts of California and the middle mile, it's, uh, it's, it's important for us to come together and figure out where we all fit into this uh, enormous multi-billion dollar puzzle. I mean, when you strip it all away, ultimately all of us on this call are in the business of connecting Californians to opportunity. 
And there isn't a single one of us here that can do that by themselves. And uh, success comes from collaboration and finding the places where each of us can make the contribution that, that ultimately leads to success. And I did, I did what also want to just say um, what, what you know already, which is that libraries are an essential part of our education system, that they also build community resilience. There's 1130 local libraries, community libraries in California. That's the most of any state in the country, which says something about us as Californians, as a starter, but it also provides an important network um, to connect Californians. And uh, I so enjoy the collaboration that we, we've already begun with local libraries working with the Emerging, emerging, tech, sorry, emerging Technology Fund um, to, to make more people aware of the affordable connectivity program. And so with, and, and you know, I mean, I see that the agenda says I should be done. So uh, let's, let's get on with the substance. I mean, uh, as former speaker Willie Brown used to say, enough about me, let's talk about what you think about me. Deputy Secretary Adams. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, thank you, Jules. And um, just thank you to uh, Secretary Tong and Superintendent Thurman and, and State Librarian Lucas. It's uh, really a testament to the state's effort that, that the, the leadership is, is really behind the state's programmatic approach to um, closing the digital divide. Um, if I could ask are the are the slides up i can't see them thank you can we go to the next slide please excellent and so um also wanted to to welcome you all here i know we have a a really big um group of schools and libraries and community-based organizations and i think that um you know, uh, State Librarian Lucas said it best, who are all in the business of connecting people to opportunity. And certainly um, the digital divide, uh, you know, presents a, a, a gap um, to, to, those, um, to those opportunities who, who need them most. And so um, what this round table is intended to do is as well as others that we'll have in the coming years, um, is to, to align folks around the, the shared goals that you know um, the state uh, really believes um, our plan is focused on, and that's that um, access to um, you know reliable, uh, affordable um, internet service, um, increasing the adoption and use of that um, um, you know services and devices, and then. Um, you know, creating access to skills and, and, and training are essential to digital equity and inclusion. Uh, next slide, please. Just um, real quickly, um, you know, in, in our role at the, the Department of Technology and the Broadband and Digital Literacy Office is really to, to work with the California Broadband Council, which since 2010 has been the, um, really the, the collaborative entity that has been working on the deployment of, um, at the state level, the deployment of um, broadband uh, infrastructure and also uh, broadband adoption um, in areas that are defined as uh, unserved and underserved by the California Public Utilities Commission. And what's unique about the Broadband Council is it's a, a 12 member um, body that <laughs> includes nine state agencies, including the um, Department of Technology, the Public Utilities Commission, uh, the Transportation Agency, Department of Education, State Libraries, the Tribal Advisor, et cetera, and the um, you know, uh, Department of General Services um, and the California Emerging Technology Fund. Um, and really shows just how the state is working together um, to leverage the power of government to um, support the digital divide. Um, I think as, as Superintendent Thurman said that um, as we all experienced with COVID and the pandemic that um, 
you know, an additional light was shown on the digital divide. And um, the work of the broadband council was significantly changed by the governor's broadband executive order uh, in response to COVID, which directed the broadband council to develop uh, really in just four short months with a lot of input and collaboration from you folks to develop a state broadband for all action plan um, that had a number of actions designed to, um, you know, address affordability, increase the state's mapping, um, identify funding, um, and really uh, look at policies and processes that can improve to support the digital divide. And then as, uh, um, you know, uh, you know, all of our uh, previous speakers that indicated that Senate Bill 156 really changed the game in providing the uh, much needed $6 billion to support middle and last mile infrastructure um, that was called out in the action plan. And, and the middle mile effort is being led um, by Department of Technology and my colleague Mark Monroe, who you'll hear from later. And then the CPUC uh, is really uh, leading the effort on the last mile. Next slide, please. Um, so, uh, you know, this portion here of the program is to uh, give folks an update on the work that we're doing on the um, broadband for all action plan. So while uh, the Department of Technology and our office helped support um, and monitor the, the overall progress of the action plan, we lead on um, six uh, specific items. and. Um, the first is working to enhance permitting process at all levels of government to uh, support the expeditious deployment of a lot of the broadband uh, infrastructure that's being deployed over the next several years uh, to work with the Department of uh, General Services on identifying state properties for possible use for broadband infrastructure, um, to look at ways to promote state contractual vehicles to support cost savings and efficient purpose, uh, purchasing of broadband services and equipment. Um, uh, the next uh, item is to promote and um, track the uh, progress of adoption programs and device programs throughout the state. This roundtable um, and many others to follow are really, uh, um, you know, an example of number 18, where we're working with a number of other partners to develop a multi-layered network of digital inclusion stakeholders to address needs, share resources, and coordinate initiatives. And then lastly, uh, working to establish a broadband for all portal, which would serve as a central repository of what's going on in the state. Next slide, please. Um, I'd like to introduce Jason Kenny from uh, the Department of General Services to um, share with you about some of the work we're doing on uh, state property identification. Jason? Yeah, hi everybody. Uh, hope you all can hear me. There were some technical glitches on the last one of these. Um, but assuming you can, um, wanted to uh, talk a little bit here about kind of what we're doing on the state side and, you know, at least a, a couple of, of starting ideas on how collaboration might be uh, possible with uh, you know partners on the, on the school district level, uh, libraries and the like. Um, at the end of the day, we have uh, about 44,000 pieces of property in California that's under state control. Some of these, as you can imagine, are lakes and you know forested mountaintops and beaches and those sorts of things. Um, others, state office buildings, uh, 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 highway patrol offices, those sorts of things. It really runs the gamut. Um, but, you know, working with our partners at CDT, CQC, um, and uh, <clears throat> kind of overlaying state property with, uh, you know, middle mile network uh, uh, proposed paths, there's quite a bit of overlap between where the state property sits and um, potential uh, uh, installation spaces. Beyond that, um, you know, the state has in its inventory about 24,000 buildings. Some of these are lifeguard stations, you're not putting an antenna on a lifeguard station. Uh, but, you know, other structures, you absolutely could. We do own comms towers, um, some for emergency use, some for non-emergency use, where that could be piggybacked off of. And so the opportunity for state property to be leveraged is, is pretty critical. Um, one of the things that we you know, are doing or will be doing soon is you know, working with industry partners on you know, a survey to, to try to better understand the types of installation on state property, not just where, but how. 
uh, some of this broadband infrastructure being best deployed? Is that underground infrastructure? Is that siting of a, of a you know a forty uh, foot tall uh, uh, tower? Is that putting antennas on buildings and those sorts of things? And um, you know, given given the, the proximity of, of of state office, not state office, but state property, uh, especially in some rural communities, you know, there's there's a last mile element there that's quite attractive too. But um, as we learn, I think there's an opportunity to to share that with with local partners. Um, you know, if we find out, for example, that um, you know the vast majority of providers want to put antennas on roofs and those roofs need to be you know no more than than two stories tall in certain areas. You know, that that might have a benefit, I think, to you know school districts and others who maybe we don't have property in the area, but there is an opportunity to sort of partner and, and, and see something happen there. And so I think as as we get intelligence, as we sort of go down this path, um, you know, our lessons learned can be can be your lessons learned. And there's an opportunity even potentially for, for further partnering. But yeah, we are excited. Uh, I think um, there's a great deal of flexibility that's possible with state property. Um, and uh, Superintendent Thurman's point, seeing seeing this um, um, uh, realized uh, in, in every facet of state government to, to, to bridge this this digital divide is is near and dear to all of our hearts. Scott, thank you. Thank you, Jason. Um, really appreciate the work that um, you're doing on the property identification front. Encourage folks, um, you know, state agencies to, to continue to. Um, you know, um, make sure that that when relevant and Jason and DGS's uh, SPI database is updated with the most current information because that's really critical. Um, wanted to move on to the next portion of uh, the broadband for all presentation, and that is uh, Laura Sasaki, who is our broadband initiatives manager, is going to um, do a brief demo and walkthrough of the. Um, the Broadband for All portal. Laura? Thanks, Scott. Okay, as Scott had mentioned, when we were kind of going over some of the previous action items, um, action item 21 from the Broadband for All uh, action plan um, called out developing a Broadband for All portal, a central repository for um, all things broadband in California. And um, this site is live. It went live mid-March this year. It is our first iteration. We're continuing to build off of it um, and add to it, um, hopefully with your help and uh, other partners' help. Um, we do start off with the Broadband for All program. Uh, that is the overall uh, program over the other broadband initiatives, and that includes the Broadband for All Action Plan the middle mile broadband initiative and then the last mile and adoption programs, um, both of which you will hear more about later um, in the presentation today and we'll have an opportunity to ask questions about as well. Um, these go out to um, the respective sites where you can learn more about those particular initiatives. Um, if you uh, want to subscribe for updates, you can subscribe um, for broadband for all updates uh, here and uh, we do really want to touch on some of the tools that we have for partners, really recognizing that schools, libraries, and CBOs are critical partners in communities and in getting information out there about broadband, engaging, creating awareness um, for plan, uh, um, uh, affordable offers and, and the like. So um, one of the areas I'm really going to focus on today is the affordable service programs. Um, some of you are already aware of some of these, um, maybe new to some of you, um, but we've partnered um, with uh, everyone on and Cal the California Emerging Technology Fund um, to provide this service on the Broadband for All portal. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and I am going to put in my home zip code in the Central Valley, right off of 99. Um, and we're going to look for affordable service offerings for um, internet service and um, devices in that area. So when we come here, we're going to start clicking some of the conditions that might apply to me in my household. And as you do that, you're able to see um, offers that start to come up that are available in your zip code. Um, the first thing that we always are leading with is with the affordable connectivity program. Again, you're going to hear more about that later on. Um, some of you are already very engaged in this and very engaged in creating awareness. Um, and so we have that feature here because in a lot of instances, that $30 a month subsidy 
may actually be able to um, offset the full cost of the, um, the uh, low cost offerings from these providers in this area. So if you have folks that are coming to you asking for um, help finding internet, this is a place that you can come, help them navigate to putting in their, their, their uh, zip code and then finding offers and then um, subsequently being able to sign up for those as well as the affordable connectivity program that may zero that cost out. It's a huge, huge area of, of help. Um, I will touch briefly on the planning area of the portal. Um, again, the portal is something that we're going to continue to build off of, and this is where we really want to engage with you and receive feedback and get some, um, some help from you. So currently we have um, some resources and toolkits that we have uh, put together and shared out on here. These are all for you to uh, download, take a look at, see if it helps um, with uh, efforts in your area. Specifically around the digital inclusion, a lot of you are um, actively involved in this currently, um, and it's also an opportunity to see what other areas um, are working on. I do want to call out um, California State Library um, uh, as having one of our digital skills training tools that is featured on here. Um, we have uh, skills under parent university, um, really catering to um, being able to have those digital skill sets. Um, we also have an area for um, residents where they can find the same thing with affordable um, service offerings. And then um, we have an area for broadband for all, giving you kind of a little bit of the background on what has um, created all of this. Scott touched on that on some of the previous slides. And then um, if you do need to reach us for, for anything, if there's something that is missing from the, um, the website, we have an opportunity for you to contact us, um, let us know what it is that is missing, or if you have something that you want to contribute, that's also something that we really want um, to hear from you on. Um, going back over here to um, the, the area for our partners, we have a funding database. This is um, in the process of being updated. We're gonna have um, some of the newer programs that are coming up. It's a searchable funding database. So I am just going to go under libraries. I'm gonna look for, um, let's see, we're gonna do deployment. And we have um, some of the, or excuse me, that was education. Um, some of the programs that come up that um, uh, education uh, entities are, uh, are eligible to apply for. So it's a way for you to search for funding, um, provides more information if you're looking for that. Um, and if you say, hey, this sounds like something that I want to go ahead and apply for, and then you can actually like link out to that um, and start the, the application process. So um, I think that kind of uh, summarizes really what uh, we wanted to cover today. We will be continuing to post um, events on here, so please keep an eye out for that. Um, this is basically where you will come to see um, events like this or events that our partners are hosting, um, and that will be um, up here and updated um, on a regular basis. So I think uh, with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Scott. Thank you, Laura. Um, just want to say great job um, to you and the team for your work putting together the portal and to your commitment to um, collaborating with a whole host of partners to build this out in a in a bi-directional fashion. So it's like, you know, like you said, we're um, you know, putting information together, but really the call to action is to um, you know, solicit and, and feature the 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 great work that's being done by. Um, local and regional partners and, and to both uh, feature that and share it out to others who may benefit from that. So really appreciate it. I wanna say um, that this concludes the portion of the update on the Broadband for All Action Plan. Just wanna uh, really point out that the action plan itself is a, 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 a series of, of action items related around uh, you know both policy process improvement um, identifying funding, um, you know, uh, creating a framework for collaboration between entities. Um, we're going to uh, go into the next portion of the agenda, which is on the uh, Middle Mile Broadband Initiative, which really addresses the um, the the <laughs> the need to address the 
uh, missing middle mile infrastructure to make uh, last mile connectivity more um, uh, affordable and accessible um, to individuals. And I'd like to introduce uh, Mark Monroe uh, from our office to take over this portion. Yes, good afternoon, Scott, and thank you. Oh, yeah, so I'm Mark Monroe, I'm the, the Deputy Director for the Middle Mile Broadband Initiative here at CDT. Um, and uh, go, go to the next slide. I think this is, this is really um, uh, created by the SB 156 uh, last year. It was uh, enacted last July. Um, the, the budget package as a whole provide a $6 billion investment over uh, uh, three years to, uh, to expand broadband infrastructure statewide, uh, increase affordability, and and enhance access to, to Californians, and particularly those that are underserved or are unserved and underserved. Uh, the package uh, provided $3.25 billion uh, to develop uh, a statewide middle mile network that was estimated at the time to be more than 8,000 miles long, um, and, uh, and also provided $2.75 billion for last mile infrastructure grants, as well as a, a loan loss reserve account to help with um, to back financing and to provide some uh, technical assistance to uh, uh, to some of the communities that would be looking to expand last mile in their area. Can I go to the next slide? Uh, SB 156, uh, it um, you know assigned a number of roles and responsibilities in, in, in this uh, endeavor, uh, specifically relative to the Middle Mile Broadband Initiative. It put uh, CDT um, as the uh, as the the manager and kind of overseeing the, the project as a whole, the Public Utilities Commission um, is uh, helps identify where the unserved and underserved areas are, are located throughout the state, and uh, go through their public proceeding process to get uh, public input on that. Um, SB one hundred and fifty six also required uh, the state to work with a third party administrator, um, and Golden State Net is is that administrator uh, that we're working with. Um, they have the they added a lens of having um, operated and uh, having experience operating a network before and, and uh, making sure that what we design is not something that just works on paper, but actually works as a network uh, that provides reliable service. And then, of course, um, the, you know, a key partner is Caltrans. Um, they, uh, the, the, the overall perspective or the, the, the concept between SB 156 was using the state's infrastructure to, um, to put in the, the, the broadband infrastructure. And so, um, understanding that uh, state highways connect, um, you know, can get most of the way to most of the unserved and underserved communities throughout the state. Um, the the three point two five billion dollars was really intended to develop as much as possible and build as much as possible, but develop a, a statewide middle mile network that uh, could could link up these uh, uh, these communities, uh, so that when last mile providers would have would have a middle mile to connect to, and uh, so, and then of course there's Department of Finance. Um, they uh, handle the budget side of uh, this project, um, and uh, a really key is that we'll get to a little more here. SB 156 or, and the budget package uh, is really funded with federal funds from the state and local fiscal recovery fund. Um, SLFRF. Most of us will be familiar with ARPA. That was the term used for the first nine months, um, and uh, but. It has certain guidelines that are associated with that, and, and in the Department of Finance is really pulling together all of the reporting requirements that the U.S. Treasurer um, needs for that. Go ahead, next slide. So, um, you know, one of the one of the uh, the functions uh, that was required by of CDT um, in SB 156 was establishment of a middle mile advisory committee. Uh, I hope uh, most of the the folks on this call have have been um, logging on to those. They happen usually about the, the third Friday of every month. Um, and uh, in, in doing that, we started with establishing some guiding principles. Um, and uh, the first being to provide affordable open access middle mile broadband infrastructure um, to, uh, to really connect to these unserved and underserved communities throughout the state. Um, the second, to, to build the network expeditiously um, including the use of existing infrastructure. And so as we'll get to a little later, there is uh, SB 156. While the, the intent is to build as much as possible, um, there is room um, to, uh, to the extent that the funding um, is insufficient to build all of it, to uh, use, to, to leverage existing infrastructure to, um, to fill in the gaps. And then the last is to, uh, to prioritize the connectivity to, to unserved and underserved communities, um, including community institutions. So um, these are really, this, this is the really the, the intent of the project and the, uh, the guiding principles for the, 
for the MMAC. Go ahead, next slide. Uh, this this slide here kind of just illustrates the the, the fact that kind of the this project is is moving forward in stages. Not surprising for a project of this size. Um, you know, we started uh, last August in terms of the Public Utilities Commission. In addition to the MMAC being established, the Public Public Utilities Commission um, taking in public input in August and September um, through a proceeding to to help better identify um, where the the areas of need are in the state. Um, uh, at the same time, um, the Golden State Net and Caltrans have been working with CDT to, to design and engineer um, um, the, the network that we'll be building. Um, and uh, as, as, we move, as, as we identify where we need Caltrans to, or where, where the system potentially will go, we need Caltrans to do the, the pre-construction work. Um, and uh, this is something that historically takes, you know, one or two years at least to to, to go from the point of deciding to do a project to actually um, being able to go to contract for it. Uh, it involves all of the design and engineering and the, uh, uh, the, the survey work and the environmental and such uh, and, and the permitting. So go to the next slide. Uh, this, this slide here really just kind of uh, is more uh, illustrative um, in the sense that it just shows that the, the vast majority of the expenditures um, will be driven by the actual construction work um, once that starts and that um, it's, it's also reflects the fact that um, a lot of that won't happen until um, start ramping up until start 23 and 24 as that pre-construction work that Caltrans is doing um, is, is finalized and, and removed to construction. Next slide. Uh, so as mentioned before, um, uh, the the funding package, the 3.25 billion for the the Middle Ohio Broadband Initiative, is uh, ARPA funding, um, and uh, some of the requirements for the ARPA funding include that it be uh, uh, under contract by December 2024, and that uh, those contracts be liquidated and, and the project be completed by December of 2026. So we have a very tight time frame for moving from where we're at right now to um, being able to identify where the, um, where the unserved and underserved locations are uh, to moving um, through the pre-construction and getting to construction. Um, then as mentioned before, the, the 3.25 billion was not initially anticipated uh, to be enough to build out uh, what was initially estimated to be a system that was more than 8,000 miles. Um, and so I think we've, uh, as a rule of thumb, have indicated that we hope to be able to actually build at least 6,000 miles of the network, uh, assuming that size, um, and that you know the, the, the 8,000 miles, and then um, we will uh, we anticipate then um, um, filling in the, the gaps there using the leasing of existing infrastructure through dark fiber IRUs. Uh, next slide. And with that, I'll turn it over to Eric Kunzinger of. Uh, Golden State Net to talk through where they are with the, their mapping efforts. Thanks, um, Mark. Appreciate that. Um, Eric Hunsinger, Vice President of Infrastructure at Golden State Net. Next slide, please. So we're going to overview, uh, do a quick overview of some of the objectives uh, for the network, some of the elements that came into the decision making process. Um, and then um, you'll get a look at uh, the recommended network design uh, as it is across the state and how that's broken out into the development regions defined by the TPA. Next slide, please. Um, thank you. Uh, jumped right to the heart of it. Um, so the the third party administrator as uh, defined by SB 156 had responsibility for uh, developing uh, the network uh, in coordination with the CPUC and CDT. So under Secretary Tong's uh, auspice, as well as contributions from Deputy Secretary Mark Monroe and Deputy Secretary Scott Adams, we began analyzing uh, the need uh, which there is a variety, uh, one of the largest, you know, uh, uh, economies in the world uh, has uh, the potential to uh, bring to bear a substantial amount of connectivity to all its constituents across the four corners of California. Uh, there's a varied region by mountainous, 
of farmland, urban, rural, so many factors. Um, so we started with the CPUC middle mile map to begin to guide the recommended construction routes. Uh, we engaged with a diverse set of uh, communities, uh, including um, regional broadband consortia, um, public comment, collaboration with the CPUC uh, on their gathered data about uh, public comment, as well as analysis, uh, economic analysis, uh, and then CDT as well, coordinating um, through, through partnerships uh, with the legislature in uh, guiding this process. So once we received those comments, we began to define where the network priorities were. Uh, those are important because there's only so much funding to go around. And uh, the priority here is to construct as much uh, network as possible. The benefit of construction is that uh, the state will own the asset for as long as it's usable, typically 30 years, maybe 40 years, with the option to upgrade that infrastructure when it's needed. In addition to that, the flexibility of design is put in place. Uh, so the standard rule of thumb is that uh, we will treat the network as almost a metropolitan network with connection points about every 2,500 feet. Uh, they won't be built in advance, but they'll be, uh, the, the philosophy is to allow connection where last mile opportunities might be created in the future. So whatever is ready now can take advantage, but whatever is planned for in the communities can leverage the investment that the state is making in this network. Next slide, please. So um, as Mr. Monroe noted, uh, Caltrans is an important partner in this effort. Uh, they have a sizable uh, experience, a, 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 an organization, sizable organization with experience in project managing, managing a large amount of real estate. And then in addition to that, they have a lot of right of way. And that is the key element to getting this done quickly. Uh, so they are the linchpin to, to getting this constructed in, in a, a efficient and a cost effective manner, as well as holding the rights of way, which are so important to telecom networks. Um, in addition to that, we may strategically, where it makes sense, leverage commercial partnerships uh, where perhaps public funding has already built infrastructure or if there's commercial infrastructure that might be relevant to the core components of the network, but that does not supersede the plans that CDT has placed to do construction into uh, the various uh, uh, areas of California. In addition to that, we're seeking out uh, joint build opportunities with commercial carriers and uh, community organizations, anyone looking to do construction uh, through dig once policy, we wanna partner with them to reduce the overall costs associated with the construction of the network. Uh, next slide, please. So as we go through this, we'll be uh, determining uh, the priorities of build versus buy versus joint build, as I kind of described a little bit before. Um, and uh, we'll work with CDT to maximize uh, the budget capabilities in the construction of the network. We'll be um, determining where the newly built routes are, focusing on areas that are completely unserved due to the lack of commercial investment. In addition, the underserved, which uh, I believe uh, Secretary Tom called out earlier, so difficult to figure out uh, where unserved and uh, the underserved do exist. Often there's infrastructure there, so creative solutions have to come into play in regards to uh, solving broadband for those constituents. Um, we started with an initial 18 projects as the analysis to develop um, a, a way of understanding how the network can be pieced together across the state. And you'll see where we were um, six months ago, uh, and then we'll be showing you what we're recommending going forward statewide. Next slide, please. So here we're just uh, breaking out the, the state into uh, five regions to help manage the um, projects more effectively, of course, 
will be partnering with Caltrans uh, and the various districts are allocated across these regions. Next slide, please. So in region one, uh, starting on the northern part of the state, um, the, the, this theme of uh, uh, catastrophic outages and fire hazards kind of plays through the entire uh, deck here that I have today. Uh, it's a common theme on many parts of the state. In addition to that, uh, there's um, extremely difficult regions to do construction in. Some of these areas in Region 1, particularly uh, coastal areas, uh, they're, they're roads that are literally one lane wide with mountains on both sides. Uh, so they're very difficult areas. So partnerships are really key to getting the network uh, configured and put in place. And in, th in this particular region, we have the uh, good fortune to cooperate with um, two of the largest tribal entities in the state of California, the Hoopa Valley Tribe and the Yurok Tribe. And in addition to that, there's a commercial partnership that we've recommended uh, with Cisco Tel Telephone to finalize their network elements and to help build a more robust connection for Cisco Telephone and the residents. And in return, we would be getting assets that are uh, with the state of California in perpetuity of the relationship. Next slide, please. Here we're showing the Caltrans districts as defined in region one. Next slide. And here you can see some of the analysis uh, that we worked to confirm with the CPUC. This data is originally CPUC data. We did some additional analysis and didn't find any variation in this. But uh, what's important about this is that they're very sparsely populated areas in the Northeast. Those are not left un, um, those, those have not been left out of the design. You'll see as we go through this, every corner, every inch of uh, the state of California is, un, is considered prime uh, opportunity to construct the network. Uh, next slide. Here's the original, uh, projects associated with this region. Uh, we had four different projects identified uh, six months ago. Um, next slide. Here we're interconnecting those more robustly. Um, so the recommendation here are these routes and there are a few of these routes where there's a potential uh, commercial relationship for an IRU. Uh, if it's decided that we wanna reduce those costs uh, at least uh, for core portions of the network, that might be a possibility, but the majority of this will be constructed. Next slide. And here uh, in the next slide, as it comes up, uh, we'll be showing you the CPUC overlay. Uh, there you go, thank you. That's fine, that's fine. Uh, there wasn't anything too important to see from that and we'll, we'll see more of that later. Um, in region two, again, uh, very, difficult mountainous regions to do construction, part sparsely populated, as well as dense urban areas and high fire risks. One of the elements of uh, urban areas is the lack of adoption is really driven by socioeconomic factors. And some of you may be wondering how Middle Mile can help with that. Well, by reducing the costs of backhaul associated with infrastructure so that local area providers can interconnect to the larger telecom world, uh, reducing those costs in between the last mile and telecom centers is one of the key elements of the recommended network. Um, next slide, please. So here, uh, the Caltrans districts are defined. The next slide, please. Uh, again, the sparsely populated regions, you'll see in a moment how we uh, do recommend constructing network near those areas so that we can leverage uh, future potential designs at the last mile. What's important here too is um, one of the most advanced areas of technology in the world, Silicon Valley, has a very high rate of unserved and underserved populations. So uh, technology has left some folks behind and the Golden State Net uh, Network 
uh, intends to address those populations as well. Next slide. And the, uh, this was the original project list, and it was never intended to be a, a full network design. It was just an, an initial project look at how one might construct in these areas. Next slide, please. And here with guidance uh, from Deputy Director uh, Monroe, we've uh, expanded the network topology to include rings. Uh, they're not perfectly round, but they're interconnected with each other uh, to afford reliability uh, and resiliency in the network so that if one side goes down, there's connectivity in another direction, addressing uh, the populations uh, that are in need uh, where we can on Caltrans right away. Uh, but this would not be the final network. Uh, next slide, please. What I want to say is that um, here, you know, we can identify that the CPUC has called out some uh, uh, needed connectivity in some remote regions that are very tough to build resiliency in. So we have to look and understand how the network can be constructed in a way to benefit these populations as well. Next slide. So as we move further down the state, uh, we'll see again, urban areas, mountain regions, um, uh, and an additional tribal entity, uh, the Thule River will be no noted here. Um, I wanna point out that the interconnection capabilities that I described earlier of every 2,500 feet is available for any entity that wants to use the network, any community, any tribal entity, any commercial entity in, in essence, the state is constructing a truly open broadband access network. Um, so that will help address the socioeconomic factors that are uh, limiting broadband adoption and delivery to uh, remote parts of the state. Next slide. Here are Caltrans districts, uh, uh, five, six, and nine. Uh, please move to the next slide. And uh, again, uh, the demographics as uh, uh, confirmed with CPUC uh, of area of need. Next slide, please. So originally our uh, proposals in this area, you can see that there's some in the top corners that aren't connected. These again were projects uh, that were started or recommendations that were started to analyze where the fit was needed in the region. Next slide. And you can see here that we've uh, expanded the capabilities and the opportunities for constructing a uh, more robust infrastructure. Uh, next slide, please. And overlaying the middle mile. Thank you. Uh, next slide. So region four uh, is a bit unique. Um, um, it, it's densely urban, uh, but there's uh, Interestingly enough, very remote rural areas, which are often left forgotten. Um, not in the case for uh, the Golden State design uh, with coordination with CDT and, and the CPUC, we've tried to develop a network here that will reach into all the corners of this region uh, to provide connectivity. There are joint build opportunities with commercial carriers that have been identified. So we're working with uh, uh, Deputy Secretary uh, Monroe to analyze those and prioritize those and we'll get those locked in to reduce costs uh, and, and perhaps uh, in, increase time to market. Next slide. Los Angeles uh, and uh, uh, San Diego areas, uh, I'm sorry, Orange County areas. Uh, so dense urban areas. Next slide. Also, uh, as you can see here, uh, we need to address the socioeconomic factors. There's a numerous fiber networks in this area, but they're not able to um, fill in and, and, and do the job that uh, is expected to provide broadband to these communities. So Golden State uh, needs to step in and develop network for them. Next slide. The original projects we um, had expected that maybe we could leverage more infrastructure in these areas that's existing through commercial partnership. And that's still a possibility. 
However, um, with the CPUC's recommendation, construction of some core corridors of fiber is a priority for the CDT and the TPA. Next uh, slide, please. So here again, you'll see uh, network uh, rings where we can uh, develop resiliency again and reaching into the far rural parts in the north uh, uh, eastern portions of the area. And then in addition, we've identified potential commercial partnerships that might address the broadband needs in Catalina, which surprisingly enough, there are numerous entities, numerous households that are lacking in broadband. Uh, next slide. Uh, here's the CPUC evaluation of the region as well. Um, I think we're about to move to the last region. Next slide, please. Region five. So uh, this region has a mix of, as well of dense urban areas, uh, rural areas, uh, numerous tribal entities, uh, too many really to, to put on the list. It would take a slide in it to itself, as well as mountainous regions uh, that uh, are difficult to do construction in. Next slide. Thank you. Um, so San Bernardino, uh, uh, these are Caltrans districts and Imperial County obviously is here as well as San Diego. Next slide. Um, what's important here is that there are vast areas that are unpopulated, um, but uh, the state has identified uh, that the need to, cr to cross and traverse those areas in order to supply services to communities who have been left behind. Uh, I want to call out Blythe in particular as an area. There's limited capabilities there. And so the Golden State Network would augment the existing network. And uh, there's a potential for, um, you know, communities to step up or any partnership there in those areas. In addition, uh, San Bernardino and uh, as you see, San Diego, uh, again, er dense urban areas uh, with a need for connectivity. Next slide. And so the original project list uh, really addressed core areas of San Bernardino and uh, Coachella Valley. Um, but we'll see in the next slide. Could we go to that, please? We'll see there. Thank you. Um, through the uh, coordination with CPUC and uh, CDT, we've added incremental routes that really address the, the regional needs. And I want to point out um, that in all the design considerations, we've really focused on redundancy so that um, there's resiliency and capabilities uh, and, and there will be continuity of service. Next slide. There's the CPUC version of that. I believe that concludes. Next slide. Uh, there's the, this, I wanna point out, this is recommended. So these are still under evaluation. And so there's an elements of where commercial partnerships might uh, replace some of this. Uh, but the core essence is that um, if there are a few of those identified, the majority of this is going to get built and service the people of California. I'll hand it up back to uh, Deputy Secretary, uh, Deputy Director, sorry, Mark Monroe. All right, there, thank you much, Eric, very much, Eric, for for GSN's work on that, that putting that map together and for that, that walkthrough of the, the methodology and kind of the, the, the routes that it yields. Um, can we go to the next, uh, uh, yeah, so I hear that great. Um, so I'll just real quick here say, you know, we've got this, we, we now have a public utilities commission's maps, map. Um, we have Golden State Nets uh, map. This was really kind of answer, intended to answer the question, if we were to build, where would we, where would we need to build um, throughout the state? And uh, we, we know that we don't have enough money to build, but we don't know how much money exactly it's going to cost you know, per mile to build. And so um, kind of looking forward here, we wanna get Caltrans working on their pre-construction work uh, to start the you know, one to two year uh, time frame that they need to complete that. Um, and then um, as we, uh, and part, part of that will be identifying how much it costs to build. Uh, but then at the same time, we'll be looking at um, where existing infrastructure can be leased. And so in the, um, you know, in the next month, months to come to maybe a year, uh, we would try to uh, really kind of hone in on where we can afford to build and where uh, leases will be the best alternative. So 
with that, I'll go ahead and return back to Scott. Hey, and thanks, Mark and Eric uh, and folks. We know this is a, a lot of information, but we think it's important to um, want to share with our partners and stakeholders the progress that's being made. It's it's uh, very complex, but they're making good progress. Um, now to go to the um, the next portion um, and really the the last mile programs that are designed to help. Um, you know, uh, communities and regions connect to the middle mile. We have Eileen O'Dell um, from the California Public Utilities Commission. Eileen. Hi, thank you, Scott. Can folks hear me? Yep. Great, thank you so much. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for allowing me to provide an update on the CPUC's last mile broadband funding activities. I'm so excited to be here. As Scott said, my name is Eileen O'Dell and I'm an advisor for Commissioner Darcy Hauk. Commissioner Hauk is the assigned commissioner overseeing our CASF rulemaking, which is one of two rulemakings in which the programs I'll be talking about today are developed and administered. The other rulemaking is headed up by our commission president, Alice Reynolds, and that is our broadband for all rulemaking. So I'm gonna be talking a little bit about both those rulemakings in the presentation today. And there's gonna be a lot of information here. And if we run out of time, I'm very happy to follow up with folks later. There will be an email address for you to contact us um, in one of the concluding slides. The, uh, the broadband legislation passed last year, specifically SB 156, AB 14, and SB 4, demonstrated the state's serious commitment to closing the digital divide by leveraging federal recovery funds to construct a statewide open access middle mile network and to fund last mile broadband networks. The CPUC responded quickly to begin implementing this historic legislation by scoping the various funding programs assigned to the CPUC into the two critical rulemakings I just mentioned. Next slide, please. And next, there we go, thank you so much. This slide provides an overview of the various broadband initiatives in which the CPUC is involved pursuant to last year's legislative package. Oops, sorry. <laughs> Um, to begin, I'm going to summarize the group of last mile initiatives and then I'll drill down into some of the more relevant programs in later slides. We have a varied audience here and so not all programs may be relevant to your organization, but there will be something here for everyone and if you have questions about eligibility there again will be an email address shared at the end of this proceeding for you to reach out. First, um, on our slide here, we have the Broadband Technical Assistance um, Program, sometimes referred to as Local Agency Technical Assistance, and that will have $50 million to award. Second, the Loan Loss Reserve Fund, which is still under development, um, will enable outside financing for local government and nonprofits to deploy broadband networks, and the fund has $750 million to award over three years. Number three, our federal funding account, sometimes referred to as our last mile account, which currently has $2 billion to distribute over three years. And last but not least, the California Advanced Services Fund, which includes a number of sub accounts or separate programs that address broadband needs in a variety of areas. Adoption, which is helping people who have infrastructure get broadband, connectivity in public housing and other low income communities, and funding for regional planning and expert consortia, and a, and a legacy infrastructure grant program with some statutory differences which, between that and the federal funding account. And then the box on the right just briefly summarizes the CPUC's contribution to the Middle Mile Initiative led by DOT for which Mark and Eric just provided their update. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna go over this one fairly quickly, but the table on this slide categorizes various levels of public entity involvement in broadband networks in a number of ways that may be helpful for grounding the following discussion about last mile programs. I recognize that not all of this audience is comprised of local agencies or local governments, but some folks here representing schools or libraries may want to take these ideas back to their cities, counties, or education departments. I also think this chart just does a great job of breaking down different functions in network development and operation, so hopefully it's useful for everyone. It's from a white paper that's published by the U.S. nonprofit U.S. Ignite that does a lot of smart city work. And the table goes from fully public models in row one, labeled full municipal broadband, to fully private in row five. And then the columns, as I mentioned, divide the type of work that can be assumed by either a public or private entity over the course of full network deployment. 
the blue shaded cells are the work the public entity does in each example, and the gray shaded cells denote private entity activities there. I want to highlight two points about this table quickly. First, I'll note that for the bottom row, the full private provider, the public entity still manages rights of way and utility infrastructure. And this is stating the obvious perhaps, but public entities will have a role no matter how broadband infrastructure is deployed. Second, I'll note the rightmost column lists example cities that have deployed broadband and row four Fullerton is a California example where sci-fi networks built a privately funded service-based competition network where one private entity owns the infrastructure and sells infrastructure access to two or more ISPs or internet service providers to compete, compete for customers referred to in the chart as private developer open access. So now um, with this kind of background in folks' minds, I'm gonna move on to describing our specific last mile and adoption programs. But as we're going along, please keep in mind how one or more of the programs that I'm describing can support your work in any of the work areas listed in this chart. Next slide, please. Okay. The broadband package signed by Governor Newsom last year tasked the CPUC with awarding 50 million in technical assistance grants to public entities and nonprofits to help them prepare for service, excuse me, to help them prepare to provide service in their communities. Um, and so a local agency is broadly defined in the program rules. It could be a city, it could be a county. Um, there's a couple of different options, but I do also want to point out um, because of our audience that a local educational agency is also um, a potentially eligible, or excuse me, is an eligible applicant for this local agency technical assistance program. Individual grants are to be no more than $1 million per applicant, and there's an expedited process for requests of 500,000 or less. The funds can cover a range of pre-project costs to deploy last mile broadband infrastructure, including environmental permitting, needs assessments, strategic plans, all those types of things. Um, for next steps for you to be aware of, the CPUC will be hosting webinars and posting those videos to present the project application process with eligible entities, and these actions are targeted for late May with application windows opening in June or July. So those are some dates to keep in mind. Um, and think about what work your um, organization may, do, may need to do to prepare for these programs and how much of that prep work can be supported by the technical assistance grant program. So next slide, please. Thank you. Um, this broadband package also committed $750 million over three years for loan loss reserve funds, as mentioned earlier. The purpose of this fund is to assist local governments and nonprofit entities in securing financing so that they can build out their own last mile broadband infrastructure. Um, the loan loss reserve will provide collateral to local governments to enable better borrowing rates and terms for bonds issued to deploy that broadband infrastructure. Um, so as far as action items, just be on the lookout for a CPUC straw proposal. We're intending to issue that sometime before August of this year. And then we'll have workshops to collaborate on the practicalities and details of the implementation of that program. If you plan to apply for a loan loss reserve fund grant, please, or excuse me, if you plan to apply for loan loss reserve funds, please engage with the CPUC. Consider becoming a party to the CASF rulemaking so that you can share your expertise to help inform the rules and implementation of this program. Next slide, please. All right, so another last mile program and part of the broadband infrastructure and service puzzle is the federal funding count. The CPUC adopted program rules earlier last month at the April 21st voting meeting. The rules included an allocation by county of funds out of this $2 billion tranche for last mile projects. I and my colleagues know that $2 billion is not enough to meet even a conservative estimate of the last mile need for unserved communities. So keep in mind that the proposed allocation in this fund will not be the last chance for funding. For example, the bipartisan infrastructure law should bring significant additional funding to benefit these communities in need. For this program, the CPUC targets accepting applications by July this year. So look for data for interested applicants on priority or presumed eligible areas in the coming weeks. The data will be published on the commission website as well as distributed to the service list for the two proceedings I've been referring to throughout this presentation. 
And then as the last bullet notes, it's a good time to begin planning for these applications. And again, public entities can evaluate activities for a technical assistance grant to support this last mile broadband program as well. Finally, you can evaluate how you can support applicants to serve communities in your jurisdiction, even if you do not plan to apply yourself for this program. Okay, next slide, please. Great. For over a decade, the California Advanced Services Fund Broadband Grant Program has supported a range of broadband investments. And the program was updated and reinvigorated by a number of pieces of legislation last year. A proposed decision is up for the CPU to, CPUC to consider next week that would modernize program rules for another a number of longstanding CASF programs, um, including the adoption account, which folks can use to apply for grants to provide either public broadband access or digital literacy training. The public housing or low income communities account, which provides funds for wiring for these eligible entities for the inside wiring for connections. And then finally for our consortia account, which funds our regional broadband experts. Um, actions that you might consider uh, coming up, joining the distribution list, service list for CASF activities, which is how grant timing and applications will be announced. Um, you can check out the CPUC website for information on how to add yourself to a service list for a proceeding for a rulemaking. Or you can use that email that I'm gonna share at the end of this presentation to ask questions. Uh, finally, additional actions that you can consider potentially engaging with the Commission to inform the implementation of these programs, maybe by becoming a party to the CPC rulemakings. And this one is being looked at again in the CASF rulemaking. Um, next slide, please. Okay, and this is the broadband public housing account. As I mentioned, um, this account provides funds for inside wiring to qualifying low income housing, such as publicly supported housing communities and also farm worker communities. Um, and so this infrastructure would require, the grant would require for the residents to be um, able to access a free broadband service. So we're targeting applications for that in June or July. Next slide, please. Here we have um, a survey. So this is, um, apologies, because the survey isn't going to be relevant again for the entire audience here. But if you are representing a local government, a local government agency or anything similar to that, we would ask if you do have the time to please fill out this survey. The survey assesses each community's broadband assets, broadband needs and interest in state grant programs. And it will be a really valuable tool for us um, as we're putting together the loan loss reserve program and the rest of the rules for these implementations. So um, if you do have time, please give that a look. Next slide, please. Ah, and this concludes my remarks. Um, please let me know if I or my colleagues can follow up on any questions that these slides may have brought up. And this email address here is a good single point of contact for the commission. Um, for folks who are on the phone, it's statewide broadband at cpuc.ca.gov. Um, so I think that's it from me. I'll turn it back to Director Adams. Hey, thank you so much. So really appreciate the work that you and the CPUC is doing. Um, so uh, we've covered the, the last mile programs that PUC is working on. We'd mm -hmm. like to introduce uh, Sonny McPeak, the President and CEO of the California Emerging Technology Fund and uh, Susan E. Walters, who is the Senior Vice President at CETF. They're going to um, uh, give an update on the Affordable Connectivity Program um, uh, and really a, a big call to action because the Affordable Connectivity Program is uh, part of the state's um, you know, very strong focus on increasing broadband adoption rates. Um, Sunny and Susan. Thank you so much, Scott. I appreciate very much the fact that uh, in each of the roundtables sponsored by the California Department of Technology and California Broadband Council, that we're talking about both deployment, the infrastructure of uh, the ubiquitous um, deployment and construction of high-speed internet throughout California. And we're talking about how do people actually use the technology, which we refer to as adoption. And we use the word adoption to talk about all facets that are required 
to ensure that a household who's not online today can understand the value of the technology and make a decision to subscribe, get online, and know how to use the technology. Generally, there are three barriers to uh, a low-income household uh, that is not online today deciding to adopt the technology. And the first is cost. And that cost includes both the cost of the internet service at home and an appropriate device for that household, for all the family members in that household. The next is relevance, um, understanding why if I'm trying to decide how to either get food on the table or have a connection to the internet, why I would try to struggle to actually make that decision to subscribe to service, uh, provided it is affordable to me. And the third is I need to know how to use the technology or I'm not gonna do any of that. So those are the three barriers that uh, Dr. John Horrigan identified in research in 2013 that we continue to cite. What you'll hear today from our panelists is why there is this need to mobilize uh, around getting everyone online with this unprecedented federal benefit called the Affordable Connectivity Program. It is the goal of the California Broadband Council to get as many Californians online as possible and to secure not only our fair share, but we hope even more than our fair share of federal funds for California households. Uh, I do wanna say in this particular round table, we are speaking to schools, libraries, and community-based organizations, CBOs. As you heard from Secretary Tong, State uh, Superintendent of Public Instruction, Tony Thurman, and State Librarian, Greg Lucas, all three talked about the imperative to get everyone online. And they also talked about the role that their respective um, partners throughout California can contribute, can play and contribute to this goal. Libraries and schools are without a doubt a very credible source of information. Uh, if, if a household, a family, a parent, um, a student gets information from a school, from a library, they're absolutely gonna trust that information. And in many cases, schools and libraries are also the trusted messenger. It is really important to understand we need credible sources of information and the ability to reach out in language, in culture to those who are not online and be that trusted messenger to talk about the relevance of the technology, how a household can get online with a, uh, an offer or a service that's affordable, get an appropriate device and learn how to use it. So that's what we're gonna cover today. We have a huge mobilization that is going on in 2022 that you'll be hearing about. It is my uh, real pleasure to be able to introduce my colleague, who is the California Emerging Technology Fund Senior Vice President, Susan Walters. In the 15 years that CHTF has been in business, uh, Susan has led a, uh, an effort, a network of more than 100 community-based organizations, grantee partners, who have trained more than a million people in digital literacy, and who've been able to assist more than a half a million households get signed up, connected to the internet. And so with that, uh, let me turn to Susan Walters. Thank you, Sunny. And thank you everybody for making the time to join this afternoon. As you've already realized, there's just a ton of information here. Uh, and uh, thank you to Scott and the Department of Technology. Um, and of course, Golden State uh, Network. So let's Go to the next slide. Okay, and so we're, I'm going to cover just a couple things really quickly and then we're going to bring on the speakers. I think let's go ahead to the next slide. I think everybody is probably fairly familiar with the 
ACP, as we refer to it, which is really Affordable Connectivity Program. It's $30 a month, unless you're on tribal lands, and then it's $75 a month that you can get as a credit on your internet service bill. So people do not receive a check or cash, you know, as an account holder. This is a credit that shows up on your internet bill. You'll notice under eligibility, there are quite a few programs that qualify and they line up with the programs that people would use to qualify for lifeline service. Today in California, most lifeline participants, as in 98% of them, use the benefit for mobile service. Um, but the really good news is here, if somebody is a lifeline participant, there is absolutely no application they need to complete for the affordable connectivity program. They can simply call up uh, an ISP and subscribe to a home internet service, for example, and just let them know they are on lifeline. And so that makes um, this process certainly a lot easier for those uh, those uh, clients. Let's go on to the next slide. Uh, and so there you can see for California, our goal is set by the Broadband Council is 5 million. Okay, and we have targets for 4.5 million uh, by 2025, and then three quarters of that 5 million by 2027. We know that the activities listed here in the plan of action are going to be key, and they are not activities that we do once, right? They're sort of a continuing stream of activities that reinforce each other. And you'll hear that through the speakers that we have. Um, so let's go to the next page. Thank you. Uh, before I introduce the speakers, just a couple more relevant details. In terms of our enrollment for California currently, we're looking at 1.4 million households. So that's great. We have a good start. We do know that 30% of those who receive the ACP benefit, which was formerly the EBB or emergency broadband benefit, which some of you may have heard of, that evolved into the affordable connectivity program. 30% um, of the people who are signing up use their benefit for home internet and 70% use it for mobile. And um, we refer to people who have a mobile connection only as underconnected, in part because when they leave the household, that means others in the household no longer have a broadband connection. ACP allows us to help uh, this low income constituency really move into our modern age, you know, where you can have both a mobile phone and home internet. So that's an important message to get out according to the data we're getting from USAC. Many people now who are low income will subscribe to a home service for a few months and then transition off because it's just so, you know, expensive. So ACP at $30 a month really can be a significant help. And when using it, you have a choice to apply that to any internet service offered by an internet service provider. And just one other quick note on this page, I wanna keep us moving, is the uh, screenshot you see. This is an early screenshot of a map that CSU Chico has been working with us on. And now the Department of Technology is going to uh, take this uh, map and really make it accessible on their broadband for all site. So everyone will have access to it. And what makes that exciting is that it is a map that shows how many households are eligible by county and by zip code, and then how many have enrolled. And we keep it current with the data that USAC uh, presents of uh, not quite every month, but almost every month 
of enrollment so that you can go in, put in a zip code and see how many households are eligible and then see how many are enrolled. Or you can do that by county. So we're excited to keep track of our goal for 5 million um, with this map. Next page, please. All right. So um, we have two panels for you this afternoon. We're going to start with um, the K-12 libraries and CBOs. And then the next panel will focus on higher education. So right now, I'm going to ask um, Eric uh, Calderon from the Riverside County Office of Education to come off of uh, mute and to put his picture on. He has some exciting and interesting things to share with you about what the county um, of Riverside is doing in the County Office of Education as we think about closing the digital divide. And Sunny was mentioning this, right? It is not simply about ACP, but this is a lead. This is a major piece of getting people to think about the other steps that are necessary. So devices are currently a gap, but we know people will not think about subscribing to internet at home if they don't have a device, right? So that's one thing we, we want to address and discuss, and you'll hear more about that in the presentations this morning. Welcome, Eric. Thank you, Susan. And, you know, um, hopefully everyone can hear me. And I just want to say thank you for, I'm going to say a lot of thank yous to the different folks that have been part of this. Uh, one, I want to thank the representative officials that we had earlier today. Uh, thank my uh, superintendent, Dr. Edwin Gomez, Tony Thurman from CDE, the folks that do work at CESA, California IT and Education, our folks in K-12HSN, Scenic, um, our districts, the districts that are actually in this meeting that helped create the dialogue and the need for the things that are being promoted. And Sunny, just thank you again for the invite here and just thank you for California IT um, and everyone that's been a part of this to carry the conversation of connecting not only our students, but the community as a whole. And I really appreciate that the momentum and that the conversation still carries today. Um, I'm so glad to hear that uh, there's such uh, opportunity for our LEAs to apply for some of those broadband grants uh, because uh, the last couple of years have forced our districts, our LEAs, to become ISPs, to be providers of uh, internet to our, our, our students and our communities. And I see a lot of the attendees uh, on here right now, and a lot of them are from uh, the local school districts and the regions. And it's great to see the, the transition from EVB to ACP. And it comes very, very timely, as many of my colleagues from our school districts understand that our technology footprint for our students has grown in the last two years due to, to COVID and distance learning. So the number of devices have now increased at each of our districts. Our districts will be challenged in trying to sustain the cost of providing hotspots and uh, MiFi through for our students. And I think ACP is a great vehicle that allows our students and the community to be able to get those resources um, as this goes on. So in, in regard to uh, Riverside County, uh, we, for, we are currently starting with our uh, first five and early students to provide them the resources. And thank you again, uh, Sunny and Jeff Fellow from CDE for connecting us with some of those uh, 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 mailers that we can send out for our districts that will hopefully create the awareness of this program for our, our students. And it comes very good time as well. Uh, it is May. And for many of our students, graduation is coming uh, this June. And a lot of them are going to articulate into college or career. And usually when they lose or when they, not when they, when they graduate, they lose their device. They lose the, the district provided hotspot. They lose those things. So now there becomes a gap between our students uh, exiting and entering college and career. 
And this program, I believe, allows them to be able to get that connectivity after they exit the K-12 system, uh, have resources to get a device, and allow them to stay connected. And that allows them to get ready for the fall classes, apply for jobs, be part of the society that we're building and making things more digital. So I, I really appreciate uh, the idea that we are trying to promote this to our districts and that we'll be promoting those resources uh, in the coming months. I know that other county offices, uh, other districts throughout the state have uh, have had a lot higher in terms of participation rate and we're hoping to track those participation rates to show the efficacy to not only our, our communities but to the policymakers that this program is something that can benefit our, our students and our community because it is, there's an old adage that says uh, it takes a village and it really does. And it really takes a village of community members that we have in this call, the communities that are in our cities and our districts to really bring the resources for our students. And it's the idea of equity. I think uh, when, when, when I talk about the digital divide and we, we talk about the idea of the device, the connectivity, and the, and the ability to use those two things. And I think Sunny uses the term adoption for that. And I think that is what allows us to, to close the digital divide is taking a look at those three things. We wanna make sure that they have a device. We wanna make sure that they have that connectivity and we wanna make sure they know how to use it and be safe in using it. I saw something on the Q and A about uh, cybersecurity and things like that. And just making sure that our, 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 our folks that enter uh, using these resources are aware of all the things that are there. And I think some of our partners are able to provide that professional development. I think a lot of our school districts uh, were forced to be that professional development for a lot of our parents as well. So it's, it's great to have those conversation on what really allows us to close that digital divide. So again, I don't wanna to take too much more time on here, but I just wanna just close off by saying that it's great to see the, the program of ACP being put out there. What we're hoping to do is promote it, uh, not only in uh, marketing it through paper, but uh, can, uh, talking with our districts to see if they can have places to sign up for uh, in their front offices, maybe working with our other uh, city uh, folks to create centers for them to sign up. Because if, if you're asking folks to sign up using technology and they don't have technology, you have to make the means to allow them to do that. So we wanna cast the net as wide as we can, take some of the best practices from the counties around us. I know there's uh, been some good work uh, in the surrounding counties and really leverage that so that we can affect all the students and the community in our region. So that's it for me, Susan. Thank you, Eric. And that's tremendous. We really value the work that you're doing to get the schools to begin helping people with enrollment. Because it's one thing to do to provide information. But we know for the communities we are trying to reach, you really have to also offer to help. Not everybody will need it. Um, in our experience, we see about 20% of the low-income communities that are eligible need that assistance. And so as a school, there's a you know, through the school lunch program, that's one of the major qualifying efforts. It's the um, Lifeline is how people qualify first, CalFresh, Medi-Cal, and then the National School Lunch Program comes in. So there's a big swath of people who do qualify through the National School Lunch Program. And it helps tremendously um, if the schools can provide an easily accessible letter that includes the child's name, the parent's name, and the address on letterhead for the district or the school to parents because they need that to enroll along with their child's ID. And so finding ways to make that easy for parents to get will move us far along on the path. And we're looking at a large effort with school districts starting in July with the back to school. And so if you're interested in joining that, you know, let us know. We'll certainly want to include anybody who's interested and available. So now we're going to go to another anchor institution um, in the state and uh, one that I prioritize very highly. I think I have four library cards uh, currently. So um, 
they also, of course, provide a lot of information. But as you'll hear from Anne, they're meeting a lot of other needs that really add up to digital equity. And so we have Anne Grabowski from the City of San Jose Library. Anne? Thank you so much, Susan. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Anne Grabowski. I am the Division Manager of Digital Equity for the San Jose Public Library. The city was doing work long, long before the pandemic started, um, and really our work found, um, our studies and our evaluations, our understanding of the community, found almost exactly the same findings um, that Sunny articulated earlier, that people were unconnected. Um, nearly 90,000 people in the city of San Jose were unconnected, either due to a lack of infrastructure, lack of a device, or frankly, fear. Um, fear and concerns about safety for being online. So the San Jose Public Library and the city of San Jose have started our, um, our approach to digital literacy and digital equity long before the pandemic. Uh, we created a grant program in partnership with CETF that funds community-based organizations to perform adoptions as Sunny um, spoke about earlier. And so really working deeply in the community to help people have access to affordable connectivity um, now through the ACP, which is very exciting to us, to ensure that they have a device to use to access that connectivity at home and actually make good use of it. Um, and for that device to be meaningful and of high quality and, and to have digital literacy to address those fears um, and safety concerns to ensure that they could be safe online. And so I'm speaking both on behalf of the city of San Jose and the the specific and narrow focus of the San Jose Public Library. The city did all of this to create a grant program um, funded by small cell revenues in large part. The library has really come in in understanding its role as both a safety net and a springboard to ensure that at all times, pandemic or non-pandemic, uh, residents could come into our public libraries and access a hotspot. Um, access a computing device, check those out for, um, for at-home use, and then through our learning systems could have access to digital literacy programming. Um, when the pandemic struck, we took major action very quickly to stand up 12,800 hotspots that were distributed directly to our students through their school systems because we knew that that, that was the easiest um, for families is to receive a hotspot through a, a known distribution channel of their schools um, and also very trusted. So through 32 local education agencies, which still exhausts me to this day to think about, um, that we stood up all of those hotspots to ensure that people could have access to the information that they needed at home, specifically digital literacy um, and schooling. We've also stood that up through the public library. We have 3,000 hotspots and 1,500 Chromebooks that are available for checkout at any given time. And then we went out and we built um, community Wi-Fi networks. And so all of these things we did to address this issue of affordability and access at home. So on a go forward basis, what we're working on diligently is continuing to support our grant program where our CBOs are achieving those adoptions citywide. Um, we'll continue to support that. We're continuing to find opportunities to enhance our funding sources for that. And I think the key point there is, is that it really operationalizes ACP in a way that is culturally relevant, that's in language, um, and that, that provides warm support for our residents who, who really do want to understand. They really do want um, literacy. They really do want affordable programming. And so for our grantees, out in the community to be able to sit next to someone um, or be on chat with someone with the devices that they've received free of charge through all of these programs to get them signed up into the ACP is really critical. As the library, we will continue to distribute devices out in the community and we'll continue to distribute and support um, enrollment in the ACP. So make that information available at all times to our residents ensure that residents who are in need of a hotspot or a Chromebook have access to ACP enrollment information and then support enrollment for those residents when we are asked to do so or when a resident indicates support. So we're, we're thrilled with the new federal efforts. Um, we certainly think that it's not enough um, and that we could do more to remove barriers for, for residents. And as a library, we're committed to continuing to do that whenever we can. Um, 
And so I think I'll just, I'll close my comments there. I'm happy to take any questions later in the program. Thank you, Anne. Appreciate you joining us. So um, for this section, our last speaker is AJ Middleton. And AJ is a Senior Vice President with Human IT. Many of you have probably heard from AJ or one of his co-workers. They have done an amazing job over the years and really been our trusted partners. So AJ. Thank you, Susan. And you know, thank you everyone for being here and taking the time to kind of hear a little bit more about the very important topic um, of digital equity and specifically the ACP program. Um, at Human IT, for those who aren't familiar, we are a nonprofit actually founded out of Los Angeles. Um, and we take in technology from cities, uh, school districts, corporate partners across the country, um, all old technology. And we actually have the mission to wipe, refurbish, and then redistribute that out to communities who don't have access currently. And then when we distribute a device out, we actually pair that with wraparound resources to ensure that everyone has um, all the access they would need to be online. So that includes things like assistance and getting connected to internet, digital literacy training, and then pairing those with quality technical support should when things go wrong, because things go wrong technology-wise for everybody, including myself. Um, specifically looking at the conversation today, how we support in the ACP um, aspect of it is we have a team of internet assistance um, representatives that really give one-to-one -one support to households and helping guide them from awareness of what all of their options are um, from different internet providers to subsidies like ACP or anything else available in their area, all the way through adoption. So we have that one-to-one -one assistance um, in both English and Spanish that allows someone to come to us and say, okay, here's all your different internet provider options. Here's how you sign up the ACP. Here's the documents that you're going to need. And we walk them through step-by-step -step through that entire process. Um, that allows us to, one, um, allow people to answer any questions, um, get that buy-in and trust on what a program is. And then two, um, remove any roadblocks. Um, this is, a, I think I saw in the Q&A, this is a long process to get it, um, to go through all of these different offers. So we're here um, every step of the way to kind of help that be as easy as possible. Um, since the launch of this EBB, uh, since it was EBB and it launched, we've been able to, we've been lucky enough to support um, more than 30,000 households across the country in navigating what these options are. And we look forward to doing even more of that work here across California and then communities across the country as well. Um, to really look at, you know, one of the major problems of ACP and kind of how we solve it, though, is really around that awareness standpoint. There's still a lot of households that, one, don't know what this program is, or two, don't know where they can get assistance for it. Um, and how we really work through the awareness is really through partnership. Um, I know there's a lot of school districts, cities, um, different entities on this call today. Partnership with people like yourself um, or different community-based organizations, other nonprofits, really trusted entities to get the word out about a program um, is really what we've seen the best way to drive this awareness. And how we do that is we would partner with an organization. We would give you all of the different resources to plug into communication channels you already use. So that could be things like a flyer that you hand out at events. That could be things of you're a school district and you have you know, a banner in, in, in the front of a school. And it could all the way go into different things like email communication, text message, um, phone calls. There's so many different ways that people get information already from entities that they trust. And we really wanna make it easy um, to really plug into those already trusted channels to allow this information to get to the people who are in need of it most. We provide the full um, suite of different language that can then point them to an entity like us where we can give um, households that one-to-one -one assistance. So that shouldn't need to fall on any existing staff or things like that. And we can help guide them through that process I just mentioned. So that's kind of how we've approached both um, the awareness and the assistance aspect of it. Um, and then pairing that with resources such as, you know, the device aspect of ACP. Um, there aren't a ton of providers that are taking part in the device aspect of ACP. It's, it's somewhat underutilized at this point. Um, but we would, um, you know, pair that with other resources to ensure that people are fully connected. I can wrap up there, um, you know, really, you know, human IT is here for any other entities um, across the state that would want assistance in kind of getting this to their communities. Happy to reach out and have a conversation about that. That's great. We really appreciate it, both from the environmental standpoint, as well as like I said, nobody really thinks about getting home internet unless they have a device and you're always, you and your colleagues are always willing to help. So we're going to make a transition now to higher education uh, because one of the qualifications is the Pell Grant. 
And we, as I mentioned, have this goal of 5 million. So Tamara Armstrong is going to share with us um, with what one of the community college districts is doing and has already done that's going to make a big dent in that 5 million. Tamara? Thank you, Susan. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm happy to talk about the work that, um, that we have done. I'll first start off, you can go to the next slide, thank you so much. I'll first start off by just um, by talking a little bit about the foundation of our work in digital equity. Next slide, please. And that is really about um, the digital equity definition that was provided by the National Digital Inclusion Alliance. And for the sake of time, I won't read it, but it was really, it was really an anchor um, for us. Next slide, please. I wanted to tell you a little bit about Los Rios. Um, we serve approximately 65,000 students and we have a 2400 uh, service area mile um, that we serve in the greater Sacramento area. And what I wanna call to your attention is that 55% of our students are either low income or below poverty, which really um, ties into what Susan was saying about um, our Pell eligible students. Next slide, please. So as we were looking at our work, what we wanted to have as our guiding principles is, is the thought that we have students that were on ground and students that were in a 100% remote environment. And certainly we believe that if you don't have broadband or a device, right, and you're taking an on ground course, you have a severe disadvantage. But with the onset of the pandemic, our focus became that of, we believe that students cannot effectively continue their studies in a 100% remote environment without having um, broadband and computer um, access, either at home or off campus. Next slide, please. So we really focused on four areas, technology, internet access, uh, digital literacy, and then this last concept I'll call removing digital access uh, barriers. We work with the digital, work, digital equity work group across our four colleges in collaboration with our academic senate and college leaderships to best serve um, our students. Next slide. So I'll talk a little bit about um, program eligibility. Our priority was obviously those that had verified financial need. And again, uh, that includes the people that were eligible for Pell Grants, um, our California College Promise Grant, and Foster Youth. And obviously that tied to that 55% that we spoke about earlier. We highly leveraged um, higher education emergency relief funds um, for the programs and the opportunities that, that I'll share with you um, next. Next slide. In the area of technology, we had a couple of partners that were on the phone. Certainly, um, Human IT uh, was one of them. Uh, we work to provide new and refurbished uh, devices to our um, students from multiple vendors um, and really looked at over the course of since March 2020, over 10,000 uh, devices, Chromebooks and laptops that we have issued. And uh, when we decided to all go mobile, we went from everything from handing them out, walk ups. Um, to drive throughs mail, and we also installed secure lockers during the pandemic on our campus so that people can pick them up when they weren't working because we found that scheduling was a big deal. Uh, we also uh, installed software where we could on those devices, and when we couldn't, we really leveraged um, virtual labs in support of our students, and we scaled those up using the cloud and had well over 100,000 user connections to those environments since we stood them up. Next slide, please. So in the area of internet access, you've heard a lot about uh, giving out hotspots. We did the same uh, thing. We gave out lots of um, hotspots, over 4,000. We partner with a mobile citizen, Verizon, and certainly AT&T um, for giving out those hotspots. We realized though that there were some limitations um, in some certain circumstances, and we really wanted them to have higher data speeds. And so what we did is we worked with Comcast who partnered with us on our Internet Essentials Partnership Program. And that allowed us to give our students high-speed internet at home, but also we knew that our students weren't always studying from home. They were studying in different places. So what was really important to us as well is that that program also gave access to the nationwide network of Xfinity Wi-Fi hotspots, which was a big deal. Um, we also streamlined the financial qualification process. So if a student had submitted their financial aid documents and been verified through us, we would work with Comcast so that they didn't have to re-qualify again with Comcast. And we believe that that was important to reducing barriers. And to reduce another barrier, we made sure that we paid the bill directly um, by Los Rios so that our students wouldn't have to uh, potentially have their service jeopardized, right, by, um, by, by having to take the money and then pay um, someone else. 
So that was a really important program um, for our students in, in terms of broadband. I will also say that to try and recognize where we may have limitations for our students and where there are students may be underserved, uh, Los Rios partnered with Valley Vision, um, UC um, Davis and CSU Sacramento to create regional heat maps of where our students were and what their data speeds and service were in those areas. And we leverage CPUC data to actually um, make those maps. So that was an important partnership. Next slide, please. So in the space of digital literacy, when we gave students devices and broadband, we really wanted to make sure that, that, that they didn't just walk away with something they couldn't use. So we focused very heavily on when we gave them uh, devices or broadband that we provided them with information about how to use those um, items and about unpacking, security, all kinds of different things that we could give them. Uh, we also updated our website for digital resources and support is where they could find, including referencing the libraries in their, in their neighborhoods where they can go and, and get access um, as well. We trained our faculty to support um, remote teaching so they would understand what the impacts were for, for, for highly, highly video intensive teaching, um, what it would do to a mobile device. Uh, we also established a tech support hotline. We realized that we were not supporting our students on the evenings and weekends when they were doing most of their homework. So, uh, so we established a student tech support line that was also very um, helpful. And then our websites have so much information. We wanted to make sure our students had um, an opportunity to, to navigate it um, intentionally. So we did put chat bots um, on our website. Next slide, please. So what we also knew is that people that had not had a financial need at the beginning of the pandemic very quickly did have a financial need. And so that financial need was unverified. We wanted to make sure that they did not go without. And so we allowed them to have devices and hotspot loaners for the entire term um, while they were enrolled with us. So that was important. We looked at the students that were dropping and if any of those students marked that they were dropping because they didn't have tech, we followed up with them uh, to make sure that we got tech in their hands. Uh, we obviously increased our Wi-Fi and charging stations um, across, across the campus. We worked hard when we were communicating with students to also tell them at the time about EDB, right? And about um, the availability of that program. And it is also our interest to continue to market um, the ACP program um, to our students as well. That concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much. So much information, so much valuable work. As many people are commenting and probably as your own experience, the. Um, these are some of the positive results of COVID and the challenges. How do we really integrate them systematically and approach this in a sustainable manner? Camille is next. Camille, will you pronounce your last name for all? Sure, of Camille Crittenden. Crittenden, thank you. Yeah, thank you for being here. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. This is really good timing, um, as you'll hear in just a moment for some work that we've been doing here at Citrus and the Bonato Institute. So if you go to the next slide, uh, you'll see that together with my co-author, Brandy Nonicky, who directs the Citrus Policy Lab, we convened a multi-stakeholder working group that just finished our work in the last week or so um, and created a report called Building on UC Broadband Strategies to Improve Broadband Access Throughout California. So if you go to the next slide, um, just a quick refresher on UC for those of you who uh, might not have these details at your fingertips. We have 10 campuses, six healthcare centers and uh, manage three national labs. The student population is nearly 300,000. Um, and most of those of course are undergrads uh, and the Pell eligible undergrads are about 30%. So we have about 100,000 students or so. Um, who would be eligible, I think, for the ACP based on their Pell eligibility. The other asset that you might not think of immediately when you think of the University of California is our extensive network of agricultural and natural resources stations. Um, they have projects in all 58 counties to help provide training and outreach and development and research on agriculture throughout the state. Um, they also manage more than 26,000 community volunteers who are horticulturalists or gardeners or other kinds of uh, agricultural related outreach, and they manage a 4-H program that enrolls something like 100,000 youth. So if you see the map there on the right side of the page, we really have an extensive footprint throughout the state, and the purpose of this report was to examine how we might be able to leverage both the physical facilities that UC has some uh, control over as well as the many hundreds of thousands of people who are involved or affiliated with UC. 
So if you go to the next slide, these are the four guiding strategies that we arrived at in the report. So our recommendations are really focused around these four areas, and I'll put a link to the report in the chat here when I'm finished. Um, the first was around enhancing infrastructure and streamlining policies. So a lot of what you've heard already about how might we use the, the buildings and towers and other kind of physical infrastructure to extend broadband access throughout the state. How can we help to streamline policies across the campuses? As you might imagine, each campus is fairly independent as far as the uh, relationships that they have with the local city government, as well as with the ISP providers in the region. So is there a way that we could help to provide some guidance from a system-wide level that would perhaps smooth some of those conversations? The second was around strengthening services and programs enabled by broadband. As a research institute, we use a lot of data related to all kinds of applications. So anything from telehealth research, um, public health applications, also environmental monitoring and, uh, you know, earthquake early warning uses a lot of data. Fire, wildfire monitoring uses a lot of data. Um, that's all has to be enabled by broadband. So what are some of those programs that would be strengthened by broadband? broadband. I'm really going to focus on the last two, and I think these are most aligned with the conversations you've heard already. One is to establish tailored communications and outreach campaigns. So I'll dig into that a little bit more and to grow partnerships with the public and private sector. So if you go to the next slide, you'll see a few more details here about our ideas around outreach and communications. Uh, we want to evaluate not only the access to broadband for our students, but also for our faculty and staff. We have thousands of staff members as well who had to go remote during the pandemic. Are they just as well equipped with the tools and technology that they need to do their jobs well and, and affordably? Uh, we want to raise awareness, of course, of the existing subsidies, including the affordable connectivity program, which is what we're here to talk about today. So what are the ways that we could do that? How can we use, say, this vast student population to do some outreach both to them as part of communications around eligibility and um, you know, financial assistance when they apply to UC or when they're accepted at UC? How can we include this as part of the regular communications to them, um, as well as also alerting the, the faculty and staff who might be qualified to um, take advantage of this benefit. Another idea that we wanted to explore and would love to talk with some of you as well, including human IT perhaps, is this idea of creating a Connect California core. So either building on some existing internship programs, so for example, the Californias for All College Core program that was stood up recently, perhaps we could work in a broadband access theme to that. Uh, Citrus has also recently created a workforce innovation program where we are helping students to gain internships, paid internships through, uh, through Citrus to work in these areas of emerging technology of importance to the state. So now those include things like robotics and aviation and semiconductors. In future years, perhaps that could include broadband access and create a specific internship to work with host organizations, companies, or nonprofit organizations who would be able to do some of this communications work and get the word out into the communities who could take advantage of the program. Next slide. Here are the partnerships, and this is really why I'm delighted to be here today and really appreciate the invitation uh, and appreciate, I should also say, Scott and Mark's participation on the task force that created this report. So we're looking forward to continuing a close uh, contact there to see how we can collaborate. We really recommend that we maintain some kind of multi-stakeholder working group where we would uh, include representatives from UC, also the CSU system and the California Community College system. We have a lot to learn from the programs that you have already rolled out. And I think we could all benefit from each other's experiences and expertise. Of course, we want to also make sure we're working well with the private sector, with the internet service providers and others, and then just to uh, be realistic about how these are going to be managed uh, within a government governance structure uh, and staffing at the Office of the President, we are recommending some staff um, be allocated to working specifically on these projects. So if you go to the next slide, I will close there. And you'll see the uh, link there, and I'll also put it in the chat. So thank you for including me. Susan, you're muted. Okay. 
Uh, the last speaker we had, I hopefully you heard me say thank you, Camille. We appreciate uh, the the work that UC is doing. And we have as our last speaker, Kindred Ard with the CSU system that has done some very deep thinking and has some analysis of some of the work they've already done uh, around ACP and getting folks connected. And so we appreciate you being able to carve out some time and share what you've learned and what you're doing with us. Wonderful, thank you. Um, and thank you for allowing me to be here with you today to talk about this important topic. Um, if we can go to the first slide, I can just quickly share with you a bit about the California State University. Um, we are the nation's largest four-year public higher ed institution. Um, we have 23 campuses across the entire state, we have about a half a million students. And so we award half of the state's bachelor's degrees annually, 129,000. And um, nine out of 10 of our first time first year students are graduates of California's public high schools. Um, half of the CSU students receive Pell Grants. And so our student population looks a lot like the K-12 population and we face some of the challenges that some of the previous speakers spoke about as it pertains to our K-12 population. Um, so of course, digital equity is critical to us. And similarly to previous uh, speakers, we look at the, the concept of digital equity with three important elements, devices, connectivity, and then digital literacy. So focusing in on the first two, um, if we can move to the next slide. Um, as we look at addressing equity gaps related to technology um, and we look at device equity, um, a year ago, we launched an important initiative uh, to provide devices to our first time students who lacked a reliable device to use for their education. So this program included um, first year students as well as transfer students. And the program was called See Success. And so far, 14 of our CSU campuses have participated in this program. And it provided these students with a device bundle um, to, for free for the duration of their educational journey with the CSU. And a key focus of our program was to uh, eliminate administrative barriers and really reduce complexity. So our students that participated in this program, they did not have to navigate a complex needs verification process. They just needed to tell us that they needed this device. And um, that was all we requested because what was most important to us was getting the devices into the hands of the students who needed them as easily and efficiently as possible. Um, so we passed out 29,000 devices thus far uh, and 10,000 mobile hotspots to support those devices as well. And we're right in the middle of our assessment of this program. We have a survey for the students that participated that will be completed at the end of the month. Um, but I can share with you some preliminary data based on the results that we have so far. And um, it's very promising. For example, the uh, there was a question about whether students felt that they were more prepared to be a successful student based on being a member of this program. And 91% of our uh, responses so far said that that was the case for them. So um, devices need connectivity, of course, and we did provide mobile hotspots as part of the program. But moving on to the next slide, um, we also provided students with information about the ACP. Um, our campus websites had that information and we provided information through other communication channels as we gave the devices out to the student. Um, and we continue to share information about um, the program with, you know, when students come to our technology support pages. Um, but there's opportunities for the future if you want to move to the next slide. Uh, looking forward, we have several ways we can enhance awareness of the ACP to our CSU students. And that's really a priority for us because reliable access to, to the connectivity is obviously a critical component for student success and also their quality of life. And we have about roughly 250,000 students that we you know, should be eligible to benefit from this important program. 
Um, so as we continue to provide devices via BSC Success um, or other loaner programs that our campuses run, we can help ensure that we use those touch points as opportunities for sharing information about the ACP. In fact, anytime a student reaches out in order to receive technology support uh, from their campus, that is an opportunity for our campus to share this kind of information. And additionally, um, our California State University Basic Needs this initiative can be another direction by which we can promote the ACP. Our campuses connect um, their students with services that they need to address things like food insecurity, housing insecurity. And so when these connections are made, that's really an opportunity to also address what is essentially digital insecurity. And um, lastly, we have an opportunity to be strategic and reach out to students based on their Pell Grant eligibility to promote the ACP and ensure that the students benefit from this program and support their success in their higher education journey. And uh, I think that concludes my remarks. Thank you so much for including the CSU in this event. Thank you, Kendra, and all the other speakers this morning. Scott, are we turning it back to you? Sorry, yes, Susan. Um, and just wanna say thank you to, um, both CTF and all the panelists. I mean, I think it's a, a prime example of, of you know how uh, it really is going to uh, require collective action and and outreach at all levels uh, to promote the ACP. Um, you know, we erred on the side of uh, you know trying to provide more information today, and we realized that um, we've gone over. Um, we're all doing our best to want to be as transparent and sure. Uh, information as possible. Uh, we know there are a lot of questions out there, so we are going to jump past um, the last portion, which is uh, the update on the um, NTIA um, IIJ broadband uh, funding programs. What we will say, and I think this will ad address some of the programs, is that um, uh, many of the state entities that are in this uh, meeting are, are monitoring those programs closely um, and will be, um, you know, are collaborating and aggressively gonna go after those fundings to both, um, you know, augment the existing programs you've heard about today, and then um, also um, go further and support other um, digital equity needs that uh, are not addressed or, or, or haven't been addressed uh, full enough in the programs you've heard. So, um, uh, I will kick it to the staff, uh, Laura and Alex, I believe, who are going to um, present some questions to the panelists or the speakers. Thanks, Scott. Yes, this is Laura Sasaki. Um, I'm going to go ahead and what we're doing is we're going to go through the questions that were posed in Q&A. Um, and I'm going to start with the broadband for all section. Um, one of the questions um, that we've had um, uh, a couple times is regarding uh, the portal uh, and how uh, it can be updated with new service provider programs. Um, and I, I believe, um, Vanessa, I know that you're still on. If you want to even just pop a response back into Q&A, um, I believe you're referring to the um, uh, affordable connectivity portion um, of the portal. Is that correct? Laura, um, while we're waiting for a reply to that, I do want to say just in general that um, we are endeavoring to update the portal at least on a quarterly basis, if not um, more often, and it's really going to depend on the relevant information that comes out. Um, and we would also issue a call to action back out to you folks that um, if you, um, you know, identify gaps or um, additional uh, information that would build out the portal, uh, please reach out to us and let us know um, or share content that you have and we'll work to, to put it up as soon as we can. Great, and I think that does, uh, does address it. Um, definitely, um, we've got that contact page on there, reach out to us, um, we'll, we'll touch base with you um, and, and work through any of those things. Um, so we have a question about, um, is cybersecurity going to be covered in some of the initiative planning? Um, yeah, and I saw that question. I think it was related to the broadband for all action plan. Um, it's 
not specifically addressed in um, in the action plan itself, but it's something that the Department of Technology, um, you know, is actively working on, and we anticipate that um, as part of the uh, you know efforts that are funded out of the um, you know funding that comes through the MTIA IAJ programs that um, uh, some portion of the um, you know, of, of the programs or the plans that are developed will uh, factor in cybersecurity. Great, thank you, Scott. Um, we have a question. How can an Oakland Senior Center access funding for the monthly service costs necessary for bringing seniors online? And, and this may be um, uh, one for, for you, Scott, or for a combination on the panel, but I'll, I'll send it to you first. Well, I think it's a combination on the panel because if it's related to individual seniors, I think definitely, um, you know, the portal has tools to find uh, both low cost offers that seniors might qualify for um, and, um, you know, access to the affordable connectivity program. If um, the question is about bulk, um, I see Eileen, um, do you wanna jump in here and then potentially invite Sunny or Susan to follow up if they need to? Yeah, sure. Um, I think you hit on the individual options, but there's also an option um, through the CPC's California Teleconnect Fund, um, which could help subsidize um, the center's monthly service costs. So if you want to take a look at the CPC website for that, that's the California Teleconnect Fund. Um, and so I think that provides a 50% discount. And that's, that's not really part of the umbrella of programs that we're talking about here, but it's certainly an opportunity that's available for you. Sunny or Susan, do you have anything to add to that? No, I was going to provide the same response. Awesome. Great, thank you. And I think that's a perfect example of how we're, we're all coming together to, to address um, these, these challenges and questions in California. Um, we do um, have one more question um, about uh, regarding um, action item seven. Are you also identifying county property, including hospitals for possible use in broadband infrastructure? Um, no, we're not because we're limited to, well, on action item seven, um, that specifically relates to, to state properties. Um, and, you know, we are actively working to increase um, uh, the Department of General Services uh, state property index. Um, however, um, we would love to hear your thoughts. And if you have, um, um, you know, information or um, mapping data that could support, or, or, or that, um, you know, at the county level or in health institutions, I know that both um, the Department of Technology and the PUC would be interested in receiving that and adding that to, um, you know, the CPUC's mapping and, and CDT's mapping for the middle mile. Great, thank you, Scott. Um, we did have a question uh, regarding trainings, and then this is, um, I believe this is specifically um, uh, trainings on the portal and, and whether or not that they are exclusively in English. Um, and I can respond to a, one piece of that. And then um, I think Scott, I'll, I'll have you respond to the other. Um, and that is that um, we are really trying to leverage our partners in this space, in this ecosystem. Um, and I definitely know that one of the things that we have listed on there, and that's the, the program that Fresno State is doing with the, the parent training that is um, available, um, I believe in Spanish. I don't know if there's other languages. There may be, um, Sunny or Susan can probably also um, chime in because they're aware of that one. Um, but I, I think the answer to that is that we are trying to aggregate as much information and in as many um, formats and languages and accessible um, uh, math, uh, formats as possible. Um, and we do need your help for that. Um, so those of you who have training out there, um, please, when you can reach out to us, um, use that contact form, say, hey, I've got this out here. I'd love to have it featured on the portal. And then that becomes a resource for folks who are looking for things in specific languages or specific formats. Um, and that really just helps build this ecosystem and network. Uh, as Susan is saying, yes, the parent university is in, also in, in uh, Spanish. And that is uh, currently out of CSU Fresno in, in Central Valley. So Scott, anything you wanted to add to that one? No, I, I uh, fully agree that at the moment we're, we're, you know, the call to action is that we're hoping we can all build this together and to pull from 
uh, you know, best practices and curriculum, particularly in language curriculum that's been created and, um, um, you know, are, are just committed to uh, having resources on the, the portal be as um, both accessible and um, in and, and multiple languages as we can. So thank you. All right, um, I'm gonna hand it over to Alex to start some of the middle mile questions. All right, thanks, Laura. Um, so yeah, thanks thanks to all the attendees for submitting all, all these great questions. Uh, we have a number of questions um, for Mark and Eric on the Middle Mile Broadband Initiative. Um, so let's start with um, the first one. What will the requirements be to connect or use the Middle Mile Network? So um, I think, uh, well, other than what's in SB 156, um, I, I, I don't know that we have, um, fully develop what the requirements will be. I mean, the, obviously the concept is that we want everybody to be able to provide some level of uh, affordable internet service, you know, last mile internet service. Um, but I, I don't know that we have uh, yet yeah, worked out the details on that yet. Got it. Um, so this next question is about um, uh, transparency. So what transparency will there be as to who has access to the metadata or traffic on the Golden State Network? Eric? Mark, I think uh, Eric had to- He's to been unmuted. Oh, Go ahead, Eric. Eric, can you hear? Uh, maybe we can go to the next question and then Eric can chime in when he's uh, back on. Eric, are you there? Are yeah. you there? Uh, I'm sorry, I apologize. Can you hear me now? Yep, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, sorry to use a Verizon tagline. Um, so the, the metadata, there's no current plan to collect data on uh, um, uh, traffic that crosses the Golden State Network. Um, I'm not sure that there's a requirement in SB 156. We will be required, according to state law, to, to collect some information. Mo the majority of the network is going to be dark fiber. So that will be a significant portion of the service offering. Uh, lit services at layer two will be uh, uh, DWDM, 10 gig, 100 gig, et cetera. Uh, I'm not sure what uh, regulatory requirements are for collecting data across that. If you're wondering about users as part of the metadata, um, uh, I would have to work with CDT to define that many carriers require their network to be um, in a uh, under non-disclosure uh, arrangements. And then I, I do wanna back up and say, uh, Mark, uh, Deputy Director Mark Monroe is absolutely right. We don't have the interconnection elements fully designed uh, but there are there, there's one basic requirement to connect to the network, and that is we're going to be establishing uh, that any entity that connects will have to bring their own vault so that they have a meet me vault or a shadow vault uh, to interconnect, that allowing uh, continuous access for their own network, but not disturbing the larger network. Uh, so the the the, the approach is to allow end users to have unfettered access while protecting uh, the, the main lines from for all users. So hopefully that answers that question. Great, uh, we have a couple of questions about um, accounting of dark fiber. So is there any accounting of dark fiber by the incumbents and how is the dark fiber being planned to use, planned to be used by the middle mile planning committee um, and who's leading the effort to identify dark fiber for CDT? Yeah, so I mean, I'll, I'll kind of can probably have uh, Eric jump in on this, but but basically, you know, as I mentioned, um, you know, we right now SB one fifty six really envisioned the building as much of the system as possible. So we we're focusing on a map to get Caltrans started with all that they would need to do, um, and then on a, 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 another effort that we have going at the same time is uh, um, we're having GSN um, identify where existing infrastructure is 
kind of going through an, a separate layer map to be able to put that over the top to see what to see where where any gaps could be filled using existing infrastructure. And so that, that's a, another effort that Golden State Net's working on, that we're working on with Golden State Net. In, in addition to that, as far as any dark fiber that might be commercially available, it has to meet uh, the bare minimum litmus test for the state, which is it needs to be truly uh, indefeasible right of use, and it uh, needs to be uh, flexible in, in interconnection. These are policies that uh, some carriers limit. Uh, there will be no investment uh, by state funds unless it is actually usable for the purpose of Golden State in, in its full form. Um, you know, those things are come down to contractual arrangements often, and, and they're less about the physicality uh, or capabilities and more about the policies of, of individual businesses. And in order to participate and collaborate with Golden State, it needs to have it meet, needs to meet a, a minimum threshold of usability that CDT uh, is setting uh, for interoperability. Got it. Um, yeah, we have also two questions about hospitals and healthcare entities. Um, so, one: Have you mapped all of the hospitals, which could be potential anchor institutions, along each of the middle mile projects? And how are healthcare entities, which could include hospitals and clinics, being leveraged as anchor institutions along the middle mile? Yeah, so um, I know uh, the Public Utilities Commission, you know, looked into this as they as they built out their uh, identified their um, unserved and underserved um, populations. Specifically, they have, uh, you know, I think we've been consistent about identifying residential and non-residential, and I think that falls into that residential like that. That they've given it. So um, yeah, that's the in, in terms of kind of the the extent to which we, they want, kind of dove into that. I think I'd uh, look a little more to the Public Utilities Commission in terms of how they did that. But uh, I know that was under that was considered and the, they built that in on some level. All right. Um, last one on the middle mile. Um, this attendee is just wondering why there's no build up Highway 108. So um, yeah, I uh, I'll have to go back and, and look at at Highway 108. Um, so maybe we can kind of circle back on that. Generally speaking, um, you know, and I don't know if uh, if Eric, if you have a, a map in front of you to kind of talk through that, but um, but in general, like I said, we had the Public Utilities Commission kind of came out with their initial build map or initial map for kind of where uh, where uh, services were needed and kind of connecting that with with state highways, uh, and the GSN had put you know kind of added to that um, or kind of come out with a, a kind of a different look using a bit of a different methodology, but we're still trying to reach those communities um, and build in some uh, ring topology um, to, to, for, for resiliency. Um, but, you know, in the end, we're, we're really targeting, targeting certain communities. And at some point we, you know, we're, we're uh, um, we, we haven't finalized the map yet. So, um, so I think we might have to come back and, and, and circle back with you on that. Eric, do you have anything to add? Guess not. Guess not. All right. Uh, thanks so much, Mark and Eric. Let me hand it back to Laura. Thanks, Alex. Okay, um, we've got some questions for the CPC, Eileen. Um, the first question is: How will the Biden administrative administration's dollars um, supplement the uh, two point seven five for the billion for the last mile, and how much more is expected to supplement that? Sure. So um, the quick answer is we're not sure yet, and we're really watching this closely. The amount will depend on the federal agency actions and calculations that are based on FCC mapping, which is not complete. And then the main administering federal agency, the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, is to issue a notice of funding opportunity no later than May 16th. And um, so we hope to have more guidance soon. Thank you. Um, and is the CPUC considering a specific sub account for hospitals, clinics, and other health institutions? Um, that's a good idea uh, or a good question, sorry. And, and the answer is that um, not at this time, 
However, these entities are could be and are likely eligible for a number of existing federal and state grant programs or other sub subsidy programs. And that includes um, the program that I just mentioned a little bit earlier, the California Teleconnect Fund, which subsidizes monthly service connections for qualified entities. So I think that there are a number of programs out there that um, healthcare entities could already be eligible for. And um, if folks want to reach out to the PUC for more specifics on, on what they're actually Actually looking to be subsidized, um, I think that would be great. Thank you. Um, is there any talk of a fiber first protocol being adopted? Um, wireless only infrastructure solutions um, may leave some of the residents at the bottom of the access ladder. Um, for example, uh, 125 meg issued by certain counties in the state for solution. Yeah. Um, we at the PUC really do understand this concern and we set speeds delivered requirements to encourage fiber deployment. Those are speeds delivered requirement for our infrastructure grant programs. Um, and the CASF infrastructure grant program statute specifically requires tech neutrality from us. And so no technologies can be categorically excluded um, under our rules there. And uh, we also recognize that there are areas where fixed wireless last mile connections might make sense. Um, so uh, kind of a long answer there, but um, so we do recognize kind of the importance of fiber and we do set policy to encourage that, um, but yeah. Okay, and one final question. Uh, how are you engaging communities, including hospitals and clinics to ensure community driven last mile adoption? Um, that's a great question. So we do plan to hold um, workshops later in the year uh, regarding our loan loss reserve program. Um, so that will be an opportunity. We recently held our annual workshop um, where we got folks together. Um, but I do know that uh, outreach is one of Commissioner Hauk's priority here. So I do hope that folks will keep an eye on her commissioner webpage and then our CASF webpage for additional outreach information. Great. Thank you, Eileen. Thank you for being here representing uh, the CPUC. And I'm going to pass it back over to Alex for some ACP questions. All right. Thanks, Laura. Um, so yeah, ACP questions, I guess these can go to uh, Sonny and Susan first, and then others can jump in. Um, so the first one is about the length of time uh, being that it takes to complete the application. People are spending two hours completing the ACP application. Is this a standard that others are experiencing? And um, yeah, why is this so complicated and what could be done? The, um, with the CBOs that are supporting the ACP program, the only time it takes a long time, it's actually a simple application, which is almost unheard of when you talk about the federal government. Um, and like I said, right now, if you're on Lifeline, there is no application. But if you have to fill out an application, it may take a while to understand what's required, what you need to bring to the application to be able to upload. And I think the most complicated process is the National School Lunch Program. Um, but that's why in our promotions, we provide a phone number. And so people can call and get clarification on that instead of trying to just maybe sort it out themselves. The application itself is very short. It, if you have the right information, it can be completed in less than 10 minutes. Uh, thanks, Susan. Um, so since the ACP is a federal program, is it required for applicants to have a social security number and or an ITIN number? Applicants uh, do need what's called identity documentation. It can be a social. A social is not required for internet service, nor is it required for ACP. An I-10 number is accepted. A valid passport is accepted from any country as well. You can also apply it if you're an adult and you have a child that is, for instance, um, has a green card, or I guess not a green card, is, is born here. You can use the child as the qualifying benefit person. So there are, any, there are a number of ways to apply that do not require a social security number. Got it, thanks. Um, so the next one is about uh, outreach. So how are you planning to roll out ACP information to beneficiaries of state public programs? For example, Medi-Cal beneficiaries, quick participants, childcare, or CalFresh recipients? 
So we are working with the qualifying agencies that administer those, those programs where we have counties stepping up to do promotion. And that's been one of the tremendous benefits of working in collaboration to put these round tables together, to really put the broadband plan together. And from these efforts, a number of counties are stepping forward to engage in that outreach. We In December, we did a combined outreach advertising program with LA County, increased enrollments by 44% just in that one month, we're doing work again with LA County. Riverside, San Bernardino County are coming on board. San Diego County is doing a lot. So there's a lot going on. Generally, we have been focused on county because they administer, they have the departments that administer the majority of the qualifying programs. And then of course, school districts. And school districts, as you know, have been doing a lot. We're looking to try and help make it easier for school districts to communicate and be prepared to support parents using the National School Lunch Program. Yeah, and Susan, I just wanted to add on to that, that um, leveraging um, existing state programs as part of the Broadband for All Action Plan. And so that's something, it's it's really a, a multi-layered approach. And then there's, um, the you know the regional and local level that we're really hoping to you know issue a call to action for there's the the state level and you know we are uh, you know have convened and will continue to convene um, other state agencies that have programs and work through with them ways to promote this and a really exciting um, announcement um, occurred this earlier this week. Um, where the White House had talked about um, not only some ISPs um, developing uh, new low cost programs with higher speeds, but um, how the federal government is gonna do the same and really work um, with other government um, agencies and particularly they referenced um, Pell Grants um, and use their vehicles to help promote um, awareness of the ACP program. Yes, it's excellent everybody working at all these different levels to reach an audience we know is qualified. It's great. All right. Thanks, Scott and Susan. Um, this next question I'll direct to Scott. Uh, so what happens when the subsidy of ACP expires? Uh, what is the plan beyond ACP? Um, and is the issue of fairness and pricing going to be addressed? Um, got it. Thank you for the question, Alex. And um, I think the, the good news about the Affordable Connectivity Program is that it's, um, you know, $14.2 billion. Uh, and I think the projected runway for that is somewhere between three and five years. So there's, um, uh, you know, it's a significant amount of time for um, folks in the state to leverage that subsidy to support um, you know, broadband adoption. I think that, you know, how effective we are at that, um, you know, we want to be the most effective state that's um, working with our partners to leverage that. Um, you know, uh, don't quite have an answer for what happens when that um, funding, you know, runs out, but at least they'll give us time to work on that. In terms of the, the fairness question, that really relates to, um, and I'm sorry, Alex, what was the, the term that was used? Uh, fairness and pricing. Yeah, in fairness and pricing, I think that that's really a, a you know, um, California doesn't have the ability to regulate rates. And, and so i um, not sure quite how to answer that question um, in terms of our ability to address that issue. But I do want to defer uh, to our colleague, uh, Eileen Odell over at PUC. I think she's um, could share some information about a, a potentially related proceeding going on over there. Yeah, so thanks, Scott. As you suggested, it is kind of a complicated legal question about regulating rates. Um, however, the, the commission is absolutely looking at this issue and we do have a proceeding open. We call it our affordability rulemaking and um, it's multi-industry. We're looking at energy and water as well as telecommunications, but this proceeding is looking at um, 
telecommunications as an, as an essential service and um, whether that essential service is affordable across the state. And so there's going to be a lot of data coming out of that. Um, there will be an annual report that looks at affordability across the state of these essential communication services. Um, so take a look at that and follow that proceeding. Um, and I would say just stay tuned. All right. Uh, thanks, Scott and Eileen. Um, just one last question. I think this is a good one for um, uh, Susan and Sunny. I think this came up during um, you know, when we were talking about how we want schools to send out uh, letters to students. Um, so just quick question. Do you have an example of an acceptable letter? We do. We have flyers. We have letters. We have inserts for newsletters. Can you let me know what school district it is? I'll reach out to them. Uh, unfortunately, it was sent anonymously, but uh, we can post a link in the oh, chat. Right. Yeah. yeah, Susan, it sounds like we have a lot of materials. Uh, we can post a link in the chat or <laughs> that out as a follow-up. Right. And Alex, we can work together to, to build it out on the uh, a section on the portal also. Um, I know we're over time. I think if we could do one more question and then wrap. Um, uh, we can um, that's do all it. I have on my list. Oh, really? Yep. Great. Um, well, I know that there was a lot of questions um, that were asked, and I think there's still more information um, that we can provide. Um, you know, wanted to um, let you know that that um, I think our staff and all of our partners will continue to align and collaborate and work together to, um, you know, make sure that uh, the answers or the questions that were asked, um, that we put together answers for those and, and um, you know, put together an uh, FAQ on the Broadband for All portal um, to address those. Um, this was the, the um, third of four. We're going to have another one next week. So I would imagine that those FAQs, we would try to shoot for sometime in June for those to, to be up. Um, but uh, I do want to reiterate that um, uh, the event recording, the slide presentation, and a transcript for this um, event will be posted online. And we will um, send an email uh, confirmation when those are up to all who attended. Um, we will also be sending out a, a post-event questionnaire. We hope that you folks will fill that out and provide some feedback to um, all of us on how we can make um, future uh, broadband roundtables um, to make improvement and, and improve the experience of um, you, our partners, and participating on those. Um, and just wanted to say thank you to um, all of you for taking the time out of your day. Um, to uh, um, convene with us and to um, you know hear about the work that that the state is um, doing on the digital divide and share with us um, the work that you are doing and and um, provide feedback and guidance on how we can better align. Um, it really is going to be a collaborative effort for us to close the state's digital divide and foster digital equity throughout the state. And we are just um, honored and grateful for your partnership. Um, before we say goodbye, I do wanna again acknowledge um, all the presenters, um, all of our partner entities for the work that they um, put in to um, get to the point where they could provide presentations today. And wanna thank all of our staff for um, the, the hard work and the long hours that they put in to um, make sure that we could deliver this roundtable. And so um, thank you very much. And we look forward to seeing you next time.